so many young people getting cancer. Professor Angus Dalgleish will be joining us, and of course Dr Rennie will be there, and we'll be taking your calls on all your medical ailments, but we don't have enough time for yours. No, I know. Well, <laughs> mine are both mental and physical. Well, we know. I want yes. you to know that. I mean, it would take days. From the bottom yes. of my heart. That's a show in itself. It and, is. Uh, what? Are you calling it from the bottom of my heart? Maybe we'll do that yes. one day. Uh, uh, Benedict like Spence, thank you. <laughs> sorry, uh, Kate says I don't let you speak enough, so sorry about that. Oh, you, that's fine. You don't let anyone speak, do you? No, that's true. I don't yeah. know why I have anyone else here. If I spoke more, um, people might turn off me. That's so. it from me, and uh, thank you. <laughs> David Ball, next, this is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Never mind the balance. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big end of the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
That was the woke that was 10 o'clock on Saturday night. We've got Lois Perry and Pete Barnes and the deputy leader of Reform UK's our star guest, Ben Habib and this useless bloody rabbit. <laughs> Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after 7 o'clock on Sunday, April the 7th. I'm David Ball. Thank you very much indeed for your company. It's a bright day here in London on this great sunny Sunday. And as you would expect, I have some great news for you. Yes, I like this one. It's International Beaver Day really? today. Yes, it really is. Really? It, yes, it really is. It's a day to celebrate the cheeky rodent. Yes, of course, we're celebrating beavers today. Uh, it, also, today is uh, no housework Dirty. day. Dirty. Filth! <laughs> Filth. Uh, no housework uh, day today. It's that simple. It's, uh, it's actually a time uh, where you don't have to do anything around your home and all you have to do is put your feet up. Yay! Also, tonight is uh, London Eurovision Party. You all laughed at me. Yes, we did. Uh, it's the London Eurovision Party uh, tonight being hosted in London. I've been invited to that, which is rather lovely. I can't go, unfortunately. Current and former Eurovision contestants will showcase their songs. It's going to be a massive event in central London. And, of course, the headline act this evening is Ollie Alexander, who is representing the United Kingdom in Eurovision. Very exciting indeed. Right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Well, today's fascinating facts. On this day in 1739, English highwayman Dick Turpin was hanged in York for murdering an innkeeper. Now, before becoming a highwayman, he had actually been a butcher's apprentice. On this day in 1827, chemist John Walker of stockton upon Tees sold the world's first box of friction matches that he had invented the previous year. So he charged one shilling for a box of 50 matches and each box was supplied with a piece of sandpaper folded double through which the match had to be drawn to ignite it. And on this day in 1832, I love this one, Joseph Thompson, a farmer, went to Carlisle to sell his wife. A large crowd gathered. Now, the initial opening bid was 50 shillings, but she didn't sell. So, after an hour, he dropped the price to 20 shillings and threw in the dog as well uh, to make a deal. And those are today's fascinating facts. What a brilliant idea. I'm going to sell my wife. Uh, good, how, good morning, Renee. You think how much you could get for me. Yes, £2.90. <laughs> Marvellous. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. You're, you're very sombre today in black. Oh, sorry. No brooch. No sparkly brooch. Well, we've given them all to Alice, haven't oh, we? Oh, yes, we have. No, she stole them, <laughs> our Christmas ones. Uh, yes, it's International Beaver Day today. Did you know I that? I knew you'd like that one. Yeah, I really, I do like that. Mm. Now, it's the national animal of Canada, <clears throat> but actually it can be found across North American continent and Eurasia. There are two distinct species. And actually, beavers are very clever, and we need beavers, because, of course, they are, are known for their tree-munching activities, but, of course, they're super uh, efficient with the environment. Don't they build well. dams? They build dams, and they help with the irrigation of land and, and uh, here is a lovely beaver that we're looking at uh, now and actually I think this is rather lovely that we are celebrating nature and, and particularly the beaver which is a very clever little animal. Perhaps if we actually let the beavers get on with our um, drainage and systems <laughs> it might work better than it currently does. Certainly my, certainly my uh, water mm. company, they do. Uh, the beavers would do a lot better job. Now I was looking back, there is a beaver day timeline. In 1600s, uh, the beaver hats became a very important fashion statement in Europe. And because then the beaver pelts took off, they became virtually extinct in Europe, which is very sad. The hats then went out of fashion. And of course, then beavers started to repopulate. And it is the national symbol of Canada. Lovely. Yeah, I, I thought you'd like that. Them. Did you see the story? I'd like a beaver. Right, OK, I'll buy you one. Um, <laughs> Just one? Just one. Okay, fine. Uh, did you see the storm yesterday? Did I see the storm? I heard it. It was very blowy. So, honestly, so these planes, <laughs> did you see all the planes trying to land yesterday? No, but I heard about it. And also I got a message, because I'm flying today, as you know, yes. saying that we may have to delay your flight. So they did, actually. This was It was interesting. We got some pictures, actually. Planes struggled to land at Heathrow Airport. Dozens of flights cancelled. This is Storm Kathleen. It hit the United Kingdom. 70 mile an hour gusts. There, um, hopefully we can show you this clip, um, uh, which 
pitches of the plane uh, landing. Let's have a look at this. So this is a British Airways flight which was coming in to land at Heathrow. <laughs> Here it comes. Final, final approach. Look at me knowing the lingo. And then, of course, they're just trying to balance the wi wings and then, and then abort, abort and retake off. Now, obviously, that's a normal procedure when you can't land, but... <laughs> Are you I've, trying to scare me? No, I've been I've been <laughs> yeah, on a plane where we went round three, four times, <clears throat> tried to land, we just couldn't. There was such a crosswind that we couldn't actually land. So, um, hope you enjoy your flight, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> now, can we talk about Angela Rayner? Because this story is not going away. And it's we only said page. yesterday that it had gone quiet, We did David. say it had gone quiet, but I said, actually, when you look at this, and if you are joining us this morning, this Angela Rayner uh, claim, she said she'd lived in one house... Uh, which was her primary residence, which she then sold. But there was a secondary residence where her husband lived, and it seems the children lived there. And it, and, and this is quite a murky situation. Basically, she made £48,500 profit, right? So the primary home was in Stockport. The secondary home was the husband's home. She said, oh, I didn't live with a husband. Her new husband. I mean, actually, what upsets me most about this story, I think, is that she thinks we're all so stupid that a wife and two children, new wife, would live away from her husband 100%. and children for five years. 100%. And, and what's more, so so obviously many journalists didn't believe this either, including uh, the Mail on Sunday. They've gone undercover and they've gone through all the social media that she's posted of her own volition and they've found uh, cuddly toys, for example, bits of furniture that were in the primary residence in that secondary residence, proving, I'll be careful what I say. That there was a look, transfer. Looking like she'd moved. What does that I mean, do? What does look, that do for her? I think this is, again, these MPs now should know that social media is going to catch them out on this. And there seems to be a PR disaster on every story. And if she'd have got in front of this when it came up and said, you know what, I was, you know, as she has often said, I was just a care worker, I didn't have a tax yeah. lawyer, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, here's the money. I know, but she didn't. She didn't. She made £48,000, uh, £48,500 profit when she sold the council house, ex-council house, eight years later. There is a great irony here, of course. She bought it under the right to buy scheme, which was uh, which was Margaret Thatcher, and of course, and she's publicly Wants said that was a, she said that was a terrible policy, even though she benefited from it. Also, the Mail on Sunday, and I have to say, they're reporting this. They're saying that actually she also benefited from the single person council tax discount. What does this do for her position in the Labour Party? Keir Starmer is saying he's standing by her. I, I think this you know has got what? legs. I, I think it has got legs. I think it's, again, this complete gaslighting of the people who put them in the positions that they have, where they tell us constantly we're wrong, we're stupid, we mm. don't understand that these people are not doing what we can see them doing in plain sight. They're telling us that they're not doing it. I, and that is such an insult to I our agree, and I, it, just, it just reinforces that disconnect between the public and politicians, and then people think all politicians are in yeah. it for themselves, and, and that isn't true. But, you know, when you see stories like Will Rag yesterday, for example, Angela Rain today you do start to think come mm. on and people switch off then from the democratic process but remain deeply unhappy about the lack of democracy and it's a dangerous position to I be agree. in it really is i totally i totally agree let's just talk about pfizer you sent me this article last night i was actually in bed by the way by the time you'd sent that so was i but i was just oh. looking at tomorrow's news we were both in bed <laughs> Uh, anyway, this is a really interesting story. Pfizer has been accused by the UK pharmaceutical watchdog of bringing discredit on the industry after senior executives used social media to promote an unlicensed COVID vaccine. Do you want to expand on this? So, essentially, the absolutely brilliant Molly Kingsley and her husband Ben, the Us For Them organisation, which fought for children during COVID, have actually, with another partner of theirs, taken Pfizer previously to the... Um, the medication standards. So the Prescription the Medicines Code of Practice yes. Authority, which has a very jolly name of PMCPA. Yeah, and Molly actually won a, a case with them going back a couple of years ago now, but this is actually one step further. So now Pfizer have been found guilty. So, so what did they say then? So they actually put up tweets that said that their new Pfizer vaccine was 95% yep. effective against infection with COVID. 94% yeah. in the over Ooh, 60s, I, I think. Over 65. Over 65. So, so basically, she, they said it's 95... 
So this is, but it's not anyone at Pfizer. It's Dr. Barclay Phillips, who's the medical director. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very serious. So the medical position. director is an, an absolutely critical role in any kind of this company. It's someone who's involved in their policy, looking at regulation, pushing uh, who things. Who should through. know the law? Yeah. I mean, they do know the law. They've quickly retracted it. They've quickly said, oh, sorry. That's you know, not good enough. It's not good enough. They were found guilty on six, six serious charges. It is the most serious charge under the UK code. And it's the sixth time that Fiverr has been reprimanded by the UK regulator for unlawful promotion. So it was unlawful because, A, it wasn't correct what they were saying. B, there was no adverse event information. So, so no side effects. No uh, side profile. effects or profile. So people were not being informed. And they were promoting in the UK a medication which you're not allowed to do. Yes. So serious breaches of the code serious. throughout. What's also, I think, shocking, not just him, yeah. but four other senior people then tweeted the same thing. Yeah. So it wasn't as though it was just a one-off and, by the way, I made a mistake sort of thing. Um, it is... Uh, uh, Pfizer very much on the back foot here, but Pfizer says... Um, the company fully recognises and accepts the issues highlighted by this PMCPA ruling, adding it is deeply sorry. They go on to say Pfizer UK has a comprehensive policy on personal use of social media in relation to Pfizer's business, which prohibits colleagues from interacting with any social media related to Pfizer's medicines and vaccines, backed by staff briefings and training. Uh, what... What can we draw from this? Because this is at a moment where actually the public's uh, sort of acceptance or indeed public's trust in vaccine companies because isn't particularly is high. Isn't high. Yeah. I think, look, I, I think what it should do to people is actually make them realise that everything they're being told from pharmaceutical companies is not always as clear as it might be. Indeed. And I think what here is really, really interesting is that they can be as sorry as they want, David. But billions of people went on to have the vaccine. Now, I'm not saying that billions of people shouldn't have had the vaccine. What I'm saying is those billions of people should have actually been fully informed. I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, look, you know that uh, I've changed my position on this because of the, as, as we had more evidence. Because of misleading information Right, so like we, were told, we were told right at the beginning that obviously, and you do believe the pharmaceutical company because they've gone through trials, and we were told that that vaccine basically stopped you getting it and it also stopped you uh, passing it on. Transmitting it. Transmitting it. And both of those statements were false. They were false. Yes. And so people need to just look at things with open eyes. They need to look at anything they're presented and say, hang on a minute, let me do some of my own research. Yeah. Let me dig a bit deeper. Don't just believe the headlines on anything. But also, you have a responsibility <coughs> as a drug company yeah. to just put out accurate information. The problem is, David, is that the money to be made here was so vast yeah, I agree. that these drug companies, just like with, um, you know, the, the Purdue scandal in America which has now been shown yes you know they know that the fines that they will get will sink into insignificance with the money that they well will then make. we should hit them harder possibly uh, let me just um, I've got so many stories this morning because I, I was very excited about all of this uh, time is very pressing um, just just very quickly let's talk about ADHD this is something that didn't exist when I was at medical school so this is the trial of hyperactivity inattention inappropriate behavior well apparently there are unprecedented levels of autism and ADHD referrals and the NHS is uh, at risk of being overwhelmed which I find absolutely extraordinary apparently I don't. <laughs> well, we'll come on to why, but so 172,000 people were on waiting lists as of December 2023, up from 117,000 a year earlier, but in 2019 there were only 32,000. So how on earth have we had an exponential rise from 32,000 to 172,000? Is it because we're more aware of it, it or is it actually because we're overdiagnosing? It's a combination of both of those things. So look, we already know, David, that the moment that things start getting on social media, people start actually thinking about it and coming forward. Now, I'm listening to, as I said to you yesterday, Abigail, Abigail Schreier's book, Bad Therapy, on this, and she says that ADHD is only a diagnosis if it prevents you from actually functioning in daily life. Agreed. I am seeing 55-year-olds who have gone through life now wanting a diagnosis but, of ADHD. So, so, so that's very interesting because they want the diagnosis because it's something they can hang their hat on. And say, I was less successful because of this. Now, the other thing is, is I'm also seeing letters from private clinics saying that little Johnny, who's eight, is very energetic and he doesn't like to sit on his chair very much. 
He's a child. Uh, he's, yeah, he's a boy child. He's a boy, yeah. And I had this with my son all the way through school, and school was quite horrific for him mm. as a result. I was offered Ritalin for him when he was five, David, yeah, so which I declined. Good. And he's now a very responsible adult, holding down a very responsible job. But mm. school didn't work for him. And I think there's a degree, there are some children who cannot function, and of course they have a diagnosis. But there are lots of parents who have unruly boys and girls <laughs> who are looking for medication. I agree. And I'm sorry to say that, and I'll get lots of hate on Twitter for it. We are over Well, we're not saying it doesn't exist. We're just saying you need to be very careful attaching that <coughs> diagnosis and the labelling and the stigma that goes with it. I would say read Abigail Schreier's book, Parents, please read j it. J just looking at the numbers here, there was a 28% rise amongst children aged 10 to 14. Wait for this. In the 30-year-old group, 146% rise. I'm seeing this. I mean, I'm I just don't understand this 30-year-old group. If you've got to 30 and yeah. you've managed through your life, you do not have a diagnosis that needs medicating. I would agree. Um, and this is this is the other thing that we're seeing. Experts in this report say that we are over-diagnosing. Well, and there are clinics, private clinics, David, that are given a Zoom diagnosis in 15 minutes. And it links beautifully to the previous story, which is about there's a lot of money in pharmaceutical medicines. There's a medicines. lot of money. And, of course, we've seen the advent of things like Vivant, Elvant, uh, which obviously Concerta. is... Concerta. Yeah. Or concerta, all those things. So we're seeing pro drugs being used. So they changing the medication. Look, I've seen people with ADHD who who really didn't function. So, so maybe yes. And and, and, the, and actually, when they were put on those me the the medication, my goodness, they changed yeah. and for the better. The other thing to consider is these are very very strong dr drugs that cross the blood ba brain barrier, and you're going to put them into your children. I yeah. would say look for other methods. And actually, there's some good data to show that actually what these children need are structure rules working with you yeah yeah um, i've got tons to get through I today i want to talk about the world's <laughs> oldest man i'm as looking well, at your face and can i need no, to be quiet? Uh, no i have to go to a break but i also just want to show everyone the front page of the sunday telegraph this morning as well uh, this is a big startling headline the uk is failing to prepare for war say ex-ministers it's a really good read it's an important read we're going to talk about that in our future politics panel later on we'll talk about it as well i think in the papers as well with lewis oakley and the question i have for you this morning based on what is happening around the world and the increasing instability and so on how worried are you about the threat of war. This is on the back of Grant Shapps saying we're in a pre-war period. I find that deeply disturbing, to be quite honest. Let us know your thoughts. You can call us 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us to the same number. You can uh, text the word talking your message to 8722. Also, you can X us at Talk TV. Leave a space, then a hashtag Breakfast Doctors. Look forward to hearing from you. Uh, time for a break. After the break, the papers with Lewis Oakley. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, was a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Back to weekend breakfast. It's Sunday, 7:25. Sunday, April the seventh. I'm here. Dr. Rene is here. We're all here. Uh, also, Lewis Oakley is here uh, to review the papers this morning. Good morning. Good morning, doctors. I saw you the other night, didn't I? You at a little party for talk today. Did I'm haunting you? Yes, you are. You can't turn around because I tried to get past you. I didn't know it was you. I was like, excuse me, and then you turned around but and it was reason, you. But the reason was because I was in uh, in mufti. I was dressed down. I didn't have a collared shirt on. Well, and, I know. And I'm normally a uh, you know, better dressed. Kit. No, I was in a little black T-shirt and some jeans, and Lewis didn't recognise me. I didn't recognise you. No makeup. No makeup. No, no, I looked terrible. I looked absolutely terrible. Now, you, we were talking at that party about fascinating facts, you see, and, and I've had many people saying they like the fascinating facts yeah. because it's kind of fun and it puts the country into some sort of historical perspective. And then you, uh, smart man, <laughs> ha came up with a riposte. He's really yeah, upset so, about Renette, So he was there talking about how much prep work he has to do do for show hours of research and I said well fascinating thank you doctor <laughs> fascinating someone has facts. to surely you could just chat GPT that and you'll have it in in 10 seconds um you and this is a foreign language Dr David was not impressed so this morning on, I I chat GPT them for so you and I've sent could them. you explain to people what that means and how you did that <laughs> so chat because GPT, I, I don't know they won't know okay. so chat GPT is an AI tool although it's really more predictive text I guess but it, it can pull from the entire internet so I wrote in this this morning, could you pull me some fascinating facts for the date April the 7th? And it not only did it in 10 seconds, it, it you know, indexed them by historical events, on, give us one, space then. exploration. I didn't hear what you actually went through before, so... I did Dick Turpin, I did um, the first box of friction matches, and, I, and my favourite one was Joseph Thompson, who sold his wife. <laughs> right. Well, today is World, World Health Day. Yeah, so boring, there we right? go. Yeah. Historical events in 1927, okay, the first long distance public television broadcast occurred, transmitting from Washington, D.C. to New York City. So that's interesting, Quite isn't good, it? Yeah. <laughs> um, in 1896, the first modern Olympic Games were held in Athens, Greece, marking a revival of the ancient tradition. Um, <laughs> What else has happened? Oh, in 1978, the development of the first successful dial-up modem was completed. OK, I think you've proved <laughs> so There point. we go. There's so many uh, things. Do you remember that? <laughs> You're probably too young. <laughs> Slightly too young. <laughs> do you want my job? I mean, you did a very good job there. And actually, they were quite interesting. Not as good as mine, but they were quite interesting. Think of the farmer and his wife. You no, know, see, the farmer selling the wife was yeah. brilliant. But this is where I think, you know, everyone thinks, oh, AI will just do all our jobs. No, AI is a tool. Yeah. You should go through it, say, oh, rubbish, rubbish. Yes. Good one, good yes. one. It's just a resource. But actually, if it takes that, if it's very quick, I'm all in favour, <laughs> to be quite Why honest. don't you just say to Chatsy, please write my show for next Saturday? That's oh, a brilliant idea. Just pull all the stories from the papers in the morning and uh, I don't have to go through them. It could Talk, do that. Talking of which, let's just go through this morning's front pages if you are just waking up. This is the front page of the Sunday Times. Let's start uh, with that. Uh, this is uh, the, the headline, Britain's support for Israel is not unconditional, warns Cameron. Uh, this is the Foreign Secretary raising the pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu over the killing of the seven aid workers. He's uh, actually written for the Sunday Times um, and essentially uh, he has said uh, uh, it really is a warning to Israel over the compliance with international humanitarian law. Moving on to the Sunday Express on the same theme, Sunak calls for an end to the war in Gaza. 
Rishi Sunat last night demanded an end to the brutal war in Gaza, saying Britain was shocked by the bloodshed. They're calling this a shocking intervention by the Prime Minister. He said he was appalled by the killing of brave British heroes and demanded an immediate ceasefire. That's really interesting, actually. Actually, what is not quite right. He's demanded a humanitarian pause, and then he's also said we need to work towards a ceasefire. There is a peace deal brokering uh, meeting taking place later on <coughs> today. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It. The Observer front page, Cameron warns of Gaza famine as the Navy is sent to aid the starving. So the British uh, Royal Navy was last night ordered into action to help supply desperately needed aid to Gaza. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron warning that the Palestinian people trapped there were on the brink of famine. The UK and US governments under intense pressure to halt arms sales to Israel, which we talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, £9.7 million pounds in aid as well being sent from the United Kingdom as well to feed people in uh, Gaza. This is the story I was talking about just before the break, the Sunday Telegraph. The UK is failing to prepare for war. This is a very sobering read indeed. This is James Heapy, the former Armed Forces Minister, has revealed that only Whitehall officials from the Ministry of Defence actually bothered to take part in an exercise to find out how the country would be governed from the UK's wartime bunker. Uh, he says too many people in government are relying and hoping the current instability would go away. He is saying we need to relook at contingency plans, look at the planning for the Second World War and look at, work out how government would function in the event of war. Very sobering as I say. Moving on to the mail uh, this morning. The story Rene and I were talking about, this is Angela Rayner, in her own tweets, the proof that Rayner has been lying. It's a cracking story, that one. And I don't think that's going away. Uh, Sunday People this morning, MP sexting going on for a year. This is on the back of the Will Rag story we talked about yesterday. The catfish, Charlie or Abby, depending on the MP that was targeted. Westminster could have been at risk in a sexting scam for up to a year. It is feared. This then goes on to say, um, gay colleagues at Westminster were targeted from a different account called Charlie. Straight colleagues were then were targeted by Abby. Um, some who got the WhatsApp messages have admitted replying with X-rated photos of their own. This uh, gets worse by the minute. Uh, the Sun on Sunday says 100 million toon ace hit by Ray. This is Newcastle United striker Alexander Isaac's home hit by Raiders and they stole 100 million pound rated Swedish internationals luxury pad in Northumberland or they anywhere they they appeared in there and I mean it's awful it doesn't matter how much money you've had but burglary is just awful and then finally the Daily Star psycho seagulls are copying humans yes this is a very important story creepy seagulls are keeping their beady eyes on humans 24 7 and apparently they are copying us and in fact they're copying us to the extent if i go there that essentially what they're doing is they are sitting watching an entire football match and then they <laughs> fly off at the end of it love that yeah it's a good story it. yeah so apparently <laughs> seagulls are basically copying humans and have decided to take an interest in birds football birds are very clever actually Lots frightening of them are. Yeah. my sister is terrified of birds oh yeah uh, it's interesting she can't actually go anywhere near a bird did she watch that stephen king there was a stephen the king birds. yeah the that, birds. that was what it's called it was hitchcock wasn't it was it stephen there's king? a stephen king book for oh. sure yeah yeah anyway my other You're half too hates young. when the seagulls like tr when we're feeding the ducks <laughs> or whatever and then oh, the yeah. seagulls yeah. Come, just stop just stop. and they're big and then yeah, that well we yeah. talked about that in brighton yeah. they've got really fat yeah but they're also big i mean their wingspans <laughs> like this but they're yeah. all eating fish and chips yeah having a lovely time watching the football yeah. <laughs> right should we move on to your uh, papers uh, young lewis let's do it <laughs> so um mp's sexting going on for more than a year so you just talked about it there a little bit um, and the details, this is quite interesting because basically whenever you get um, a, a, a number that you don't know, you can obviously put it into Google and look it up. And oh, so that's what the I've reporters... I've never thought of that. <laughs> Oh, gosh. So have, you, have you thought of that? <laughs> what? I'm not kidding. I've never thought of that. You can do that. You can also put it into Facebook and sometimes it'll bring up the profile of the person. Just basic due diligence, people. Not Rene, why why are you, you, ha, is that news <laughs> to We're you? We're old. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Well, I'm not calling anyone old, but maybe the, this I, is I how so many people have fallen foul. <laughs> no, in... no, so, <laughs> carry on, no. Carry so, on. basically, uh, the, the reporters have gone on the website and had a look, and there were people saying that this account was dodgy in May last year. So that's that's kind of the where this whole, it's been flagged for over a year that this account was dodgy. But look, I mean, we are where we are. 
it just is beyond belief to some people, not all people, that uh, that an MP would start responding Thank with you. nude pictures of themselves Thank to a number you. that you did not know, or any number for that matter. And it opens up this whole, well, easy to blackmail. But mm. you know what? This really does take me back to the COVID days where you thought, oh, well, surely you've done more due diligence than this. And you just In, in just what haven't. sense? In what sense? It, it, in the sense that you, you couldn't believe some of the things that they were proposing, like mad things like, you know, <laughs> people's doors being, you know... Oh, I see. ...swords off. In, and it's just almost like, oh, no, surely you'd have thought of this. Surely as MPs you'd have thought, I'm easy to blackmail some random see, numbers but, texting but, but, but me. See, so so I, I took a slightly different stance yesterday and I had quite a lot of and criticism for it. I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> um, what I tried to say was that you're an MP, of course you are, and you should know better, but mm -hmm. you are also human. No. And, um, and humans make mistakes. That's what the line I took. This isn't a mistake. This is an MP. Who has well, had a mistake? Who has had training on this kind of well, thing? They all do. Well, apparently, it's not that good. D well, anyway, they're an MP. <laughs> they should know that they are at risk of being blackmailed at any point. And I'm sorry, I, there is no excuse in my mind for any of these MPs sending naked pictures of themselves, and they should lose their whip. And they haven't. And they should. And they haven't. <laughs> well, I know. because we don't know the scale of the problem. Because uh, if so, you were the leader so, of a party, you probably think, let's just wait to see how widespread so this is. Otherwise, now, I to get rid that, of half the cabinet. Now, that's a very interesting point because I've heard there are other senior people implicated who may well have also mm. fallen for the same trap. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it wasn't Rishi Sunak. <laughs> I think it wasn't Rishi Sunak. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, because in um, the original reporting of this story, I think that one of the journalists was able to contact the person and they sort of backed down quite quickly and were sort of worried about the legal ramifications for them. So I don't know that... It, is it someone that's just been trying their luck and now feels that they're in too deep? Well, so we, we don't were, really we saying, know. Or is it a foreign power, for example? We don't know. And From the I reporting, I don't think it is because I don't think that they would sort of panic when confronted, mm. which is but what this person said then? to have been... I don't know, someone also, wanting to... But, but MPs' phone numbers are actually quite easy to get hold you of. I said this, that I yesterday, yeah, and I shocked you yesterday. So uh, I don't know. But what was clever about it was that they, that if you look at the various accounts, that they use parliamentary language. They said, you know, I last saw you in Central Lobby, for example. You'd have to know what that is, for example, and so on and so on. So, so it was very clever. Yes, oh, well, it's on. clearly I someone in there. Lobby yeah, no, Most no, I know. Or, or they said they use the Westminster bar. phrases. They yeah. use that particular bar, which you wouldn't know. Either way, I think there are probably many MPs that breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> seeing these front pages this morning because I think all of us in the media kind of thought, wonder what the Sundays are going to have. So, so interesting you say that because we normally get a tip off around five, six, seven o'clock, uh, and I was waiting to <laughs> see what came out this morning, and there wasn't yeah. really anything. That, and I think you're right. Now the question is, has that story gone away? Yeah, and I don't think it probably has oh no i think there's definitely more to come i mean look we're close to an election i'm sure that nobody wants any more <laughs> upheaval before that so i would imagine that some of the decisions are like you know come on we've only got x number of months well to and go. also yeah. the conservative party haven't got many mps left so, yeah. <laughs> so you need to be very you want to hang on to the ones <laughs> you've got and um, we go so from one naughty mp yes. to another um, so this is Angela Rayner, the mm. mail this morning saying that you know they've got the proof of of her second home um, I don't think it's the smoking gun the mail are making it out to be, which is basically, you know, a couple of tweets and social media posts saying, home now. And I, I just don't really... Lewis, no. she, uh, uh, Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. <laughs> I'm going to sit go. back and enjoy Her this. primary <laughs> residence, she claims, was in Stockport. She made a £48,500 profit, right? That was in Vicarage Road. Now, meanwhile, and I have to give it to this paper, they went and they took... They looked at all her social media and they saw things like a toy, a sofa, all of those were in the husband's home. And she's claiming she didn't live there. Well, what furniture's in the other one? So the, it's not it's not about the fiscal outcome, although that's significant, because she made a £48,000 profit, which she should have paid tax on if it wasn't her primary More tax, residence. Yeah. More tax. Oh, yeah, no, you don't pay no, any, no, do you? Don't you don't pay yeah. any on your, on your primary residence. So yeah. she should have paid tax on that. And this goes back to the sleaze of politicians. This is not good. And honesty. It goes back to honesty, because she is trying to make people... 
believe something that doesn't appear to be true. That's a very good point. Uh, no, I will give Renee that point. It is about honesty, <laughs> and, that, and it does, it does, it does. <laughs> it's about principles, of course. But I just think that this is being all whipped up, and I just genuinely, if I'm putting my, you know, she is going to be deputy prime minister, and if this is right, this happened she, before she was an MP. If, this I don't know why she was an MP. That's irrelevant. She should have deleted her face. But, you know, you know <laughs> what this is. But wait, wait for this. It's not just this, is it? Because they also think she claimed single person discount for her council tax. Now, if that is true, and if this is true, that is fraud. I know, but I don't think that you. I, I just don't think this is going to be the thing that you get her on and you get her out because they think I'm most British people. I'm, I'm just saying the optics are awful. Oh, I know, I know, but I would just say I think most British people think, oh, we've got a complicated tax system. We're all just it's hoping not that we have it. It either, is so either complicated. Either it's your primary Our residence. Tax system. No, it's either your primary residence or it's not your primary residence. Well, look. We'll see how this plays out. I just think the British public are not going to be... What new wife doesn't live with her husband and children? <laughs> well, there are all types of relationships these days, Renee. <laughs> You're so modern. <laughs> um, yeah, I just... Look, we'll see how it plays out. I think it's going to be very easy for her to come out if she has done wrong and say, oh, look, I messed up, I, I was given some advice, wasn't correct, I'll pay the difference, and when we're in power, I'm going to make it all so simple so this doesn't happen to anyone ever I'm again. I'm not going to let anyone else profit from <laughs> right to buy. So that's the point. So she is opposed to right to buy, and she bought that house under the... Well, remember, under the right <laughs> to buy scheme, a Thatcherite scheme, and she has the audacity to say, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm all right, Jack. Let's pull the ladder up. Yeah, no, I mean, that that is bad optics. But hope she is the only one talking about building more council homes, I think, so... Mm. Perhaps she's going to use her profits. I mean, I, I actually think this will continue. I'm, I'm, I think it will continue. When are they back from their extended holiday? Uh, I think holiday? it's another week. <laughs> another week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Shall we? Shall we pause just for the moment? Because I have to sure. go to a break, and then you can you can uh, get yourself back in uh, there we go. full flow after this break. <laughs> uh, join us after the break. We'll go, continue to go through this morning's papers. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast Time, 7.43 on Sunday, April the 7th. I'm with the Doctor, she's here, Lewis Oakley's here. We're going through this morning's papers. By the way, just before we go back to that, Stephen King never wrote about the birds. Oh, Rene. sorry. It was Daphne du Maurier. Was it? Apparently so. He did um, do films like that. I then. know, I'm pretty sure that The Birds is a Hitchcock film, and I'm going to look that up. OK. I'm pretty... Uh, right. It was. It was a Hitchcock film. Uh -huh. I've, ha I've had it checked okay. by our very own wrong. Carol I Vorderman. apologise. Yes. Well, well, what? <laughs> you never apologise. That's very kind of you. Uh, right, now, lots of you getting in touch as well. Amanda says, doctors, MPs' behaviour, as we used to say, these MPs have more brains than sense. Disgraceful behaviour. I totally agree with you. Oh, uh, this one also. Ian says, the I birds is not a Stephen King God. book or story. It's Daphne du Maurier. Don't, why don't you know that, Rene? Uh, it was a, <laughs> it's a long time before uh, King came on the scene. That's Ian in York. Good morning it's to you. It's because I used to read the King books when I was a teenager. No, you so. got it wrong. No, 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 I know. No, but, you got so it he's wrong. the horror person in my mind. Right, okay. That's what I'm trying to say. You Can I wrong. read you Cooperman's? Yes. Rayner spends every waking hour demanding Tory MPs resign for the most minor improprieties. Live by the sword, die by the sword. She's a liar and a hypocrite and should be sacked immediately. I think it has legs. <laughs> I think it is changing the way people feel about Rayner. Lucy's got... Well, I, I don't think... Look, I, and I'm not here to defend Angela Rayner. She's not sending me a five or anything. But I just think... I mean, if you're the Labour Party right now, you don't have to do anything. You're just watching the Tories slowly implode. Just say nothing. Carry on. That's what mm. they've done this whole time. Mm. And pretty soon so, you'll so, be number ten. But the latest... The it's not morally right. No, but it's we'll, talk about, it we'll talk about this later because the Labour vote is slipping in certain inner cities, but also they're down two points anyway. I These polls aren't... The polls are, are a snapshot. I still... I still think, I the mean, I think it's... soft, that lead is soft. The lead is soft, I yeah. would agree with that. But the, the fact that they have any lead at all is not because of anything that they Indeed. are putting forward. It's because of the reflection <laughs> of the Tories. Well, they're, so, they're self-imploding, aren't they? Yeah, well, and I know we're in Perth, so we have to be careful. But I just think if you're late, you're probably just like, well, just let them carry on. They don't need to address this. Mm. Yeah, absolutely Agreed. right. Uh, lots more messages coming in as well. Keep all of these coming in. We're talking about uh, Grant Shapp saying we're in a pre-war situation. I find this article, I think it's the Sunday Telegraph this morning, saying we need to be prepared for war. How worried are you by the threat of war? The number 03444991000. You can also WhatsApp us to the same number. You can text the word talk in your message to 87222. Also, you can X us at Talk TV. Leave a space, hashtag uh, Breakfast Doctors. Many of you very very worried about the threat of war. I'll just do one. Bill in Cheshire says, of course we are unprepared, both in terms of material and mentality. Material, our leaders think we're still in the Cold War era. Tanks, aircraft carriers, now almost obsolete and easily taken out. Mentality, the Cold War generation had the threat of war drummed in at school and in life. Nuclear war planning, documentaries, lessons in school, grandads who could tell you how awful the war was. The current generation, and this is so pertinent, think war is like a Call of Duty video game. You can reset, start again. It is not. War is horrendous. We are unprepared at every level. And I would concur with that because growing up, and you'll remember this, we had those adverts played the whole time <laughs> under to, table. to prevent to what to do in the event of a nuclear war. Yeah. And it terrified me. There was the yeah. drama, Threads, do you remember that? Which yeah. was what happened in a nuclear war. I think that is one of the most excellent tweets. So and I. I do think that's part of the problem that these the younger people this day haven't really got any fear because they haven't had to and you want to talk about this story yeah well I th so you've kind of um you've you've taken the lead there but i mean the first thing i would say is so this is james heapy and ben wallace so interesting they're talking about this now you're out of office so now it occurred to you that we're not ready for war so a slight or, annoyance oh, I, maybe I don't think they that's can quite fair no i, I don't think that's right. has he yeah. has said it, and also maybe when you're not in office you have the freedom to speak out, which you don't when you're in office. Fair enough. Look, either way, we all know, we've seen the stories for ages, we don't have enough people in the army, we don't have enough people in, in you know, mm. enough tanks and, and equipment, we're not 
got our finger on the pulse of how war is going to be fought in this day and age. But I think wider things, the things we never talk about, what is going to happen if an enemy knocks out our internet for three months? Has anyone the thought world of it? Will be, Sorry, say that again. If, if an enemy knocks out our yeah, internet for three months... the world will be a much nicer place. Yeah, no, <laughs> no one will be able to pay for anything, nothing would work, so, would so, food so, be delivered? Well, there is contingency planning for that. Of course, they, they have looked at that. In terms of telephone and communications as well, there are other routes as well. So there are, there are um, mechanisms that would be triggered in war in this country. But you're right in terms of, and this is what they're saying, is that people didn't even bother get to go to the training. There are bunkers for cabinet ministers to go into to ensure that government continues to run. They haven't bothered going. Well, I think there's two things here, isn't there? Because there is one, which is, why are these plans not being taken seriously? Why are more people in the government not involved? Why do we not know? In this event, this is what we'll do. And why do the public not know? If this ever happens, this is what you do, as you are talking about in the Cold War. The other thing is, as we saw in COVID, long-term plans just get thrown out of the window yeah. with the whims of the day so is yeah. there any point anyway it's a very very Look, good point i think actually what it links nicely to this very point is that we should actually be in control of our own infrastructure mm. not 100%. farming it out or china. to china who have already said that they could bring all of our electric cars to a standstill yeah. very easily mm. and you know if they can do that they can take out our internet but also, or our telephone but lines. Tell me wh who, which bright spark in government thought it was a great idea to get her Huawei involved in, well, in know, military David secrets. David Cameron. I know, or you know. indeed, you know, owning nuclear power stations. That's not exactly clever, is it? I wonder if there is just a, a sense of, because governments don't seem to last more than five years and leaders change every five minutes, there's just no long-term planning. And no one wants to do the, the thing that doesn't give them immediate gratification. I've brought in this policy, we've seen this change today. To spend money and time and effort and resource planning for something that might never happen, also, which absolutely you should be doing. Also, is it part of the fact that all of these people, like Cameron et al, Blair, all of them, want to be part of this global world club where they think that they can sit around a table when things are going a bit mm. crooked and, you know, mm. talk it away? And they believe that that will always be the answer. But we're seeing around the world that's not going to always be the answer. And we need some action. I, I, I would agree totally. Let's move on if we can. This is a great story in The Telegraph. Tell us this story about parents. Yes, parents are being urged to buy uh, dumb phones, as they're being called. <laughs> so this is phones that don't have access to social media. And obviously, there's a lot of research now talking about how social media is negatively impacting children. There is a lot of... I would say there's a bit of a movement to either not giving your children any technology, as Renee does, or giving them sort of a, you know, a, a, a dumbed-down version phone. And as someone that's got three kids, one is a 15-year-old teenager and two other little ones, I think one of the big debates as a parent these days is about how much technology do you give them? Because mm. I'm always conflicted, because I don't want them to fall behind. They're going to grow up into a technology savvy world yes yeah, so to that end alice does know how to do her maths homework on a laptop yep. so she can work around sure. the laptop so there's a difference and it's supervised and we do it together but and she does watch disney in the morning and in the evening but that's it the rest yep. of the but, day but, nothing so, so that's very different to a 15 year old for example so what do you allow your 15 year old <clears throat> Well, he doesn't have TikTok, for instance. He does have Instagram, but doesn't really post on it. And one thing I will say is that I think that the kids that have grown up with this, my 15-year-old really has more grown up with technology than I did, I think that they have a bit of a different attitude to it. I know some of the studies might say... No, it's it's hurting them. But he it, it couldn't is, care it less. All of, them about. His, all of so, the studies say it. And I've seen I've seen it with yeah. my young nieces, for example, the pressure on them through yeah. social media. I think it and, might be slightly worse for girls. girls. Yeah, yeah. I think it is worse for girls. But, Although we're seeing an increase in anorexia in are, boys. But all of the studies show that, and it's a linear relationship. The more time they spend on screens, the unhappier they are. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and also just the vitriol and and just uh, children are vile anyway, or can be vile at can the best be, of, of times. Yeah, and and so therefore people are posting pictures and they're then told they're fat and of yeah. course then you have negative self-image anywhere as a teenager so I, I think it has to be handled very carefully. It does also link back to the ADHD story actually because there are there's a group of parents who when they've got this diagnosis for their child have withdrawn all of the technology and the behaviour of these children has improved no yeah. end. Yeah. yeah. So I guess this is the balance of what this story is saying. Is it just the social media aspect of it oh, yes. or is it the screen time altogether? I think it's the social media aspect Because of it. then that becomes tricky because what is social media? So for instance with something like Snapchat that I would have said was a social media, a lot of young people will say, oh no, it's a messaging site because I just message my friends on there. So there is this 
it's a very grey area to, to sort of mm. navigate as a parent where you're sort of sure. trying to figure out what's the best. So let's take them all back to these phones. But also, so with Snapchat, I agree with that. But Snapchat, of course, disappears. Those messages disappear. So therefore, yeah. as a parent, you can't even look, see to what those messages were, well, can you? In 2016, I went to the States for a, lo a, a period where we I worked with Margaret McDonough and we had a 15-year-old with us. Mm. She never, ever put down Snapchat. Uh -huh. And yeah. I mean, never. It was just constant. Mm, but that's also parenting, isn't it? Yeah. To make sure that actually you have zones and times where you mm -hmm. don't uh, where you don't allow them on social media. Shall we move on and Let's do um, it. talk about this article in the Mail Online? Yes, so this is a good one. So <laughs> even it. shop robots should have Sundays off, a German court has ruled. So just to explain, in to Germany... To um, well, so they've got really strict laws over there around you can't work on Sundays. It's not like it is here where we sort of say Sundays is the day of rest, but everything's open. I think. In well, we have Sunday trading laws, don't we? So And it, it basically applies to store, stores over... A, I think they're ridiculous <laughs> as well. Stores over a certain size, for example. So clever people over in Germany have got basically... Uh, what are they called? They're called... Um, um, automated stores so basically there's no person in there so you can go in get your shopping serve yourself leave and it's all done so they're saying well look there's no one working what's the problem so this is why the German court has had to get involved and say well actually no the robots also deserve to have Sunday off oh you are kidding <clears throat> but no but I think this is quite a good story because as people are more and more worried about technology it is on us to say well no we will put our values on them so I actually although I think it's a bit silly a country saying no, the technology will do as we do is not the well, worst thing in the world. I would, I would actually just flip that on its head and say no, we shouldn't make people redundant for the rest of their lives using robots. Let's bring back people. I agree, and I've talked talk to you about this before. That um, when you are at a checkout, and particularly in rural communities, it's lovely to talk to someone, and and uh, I think it's important. You're right. You need to be in control of the technology, not the yeah, other way around. Absolutely. Just because it can do something doesn't mean it should. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And I think that's a, a nice one to but end. But I did it, like this story. It, yeah. It's a lovely one to end. Well, I hope you have a lovely weekend uh, playing you. with your AI. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much indeed, Lewis, for coming in. That's Thank Lewis you for Oakley, a broadcaster. Right, let's take some calls, Stephen. Ooh, he's in southwest France. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, doctors. Good, good morning, good morning. Um, actually, I'm in Spain at the moment, in oh. Herrera. Oh, how... Oh, ooh, that's very nice part of the world. I know it very well. I was there for my birthday last year. Right, I I'm coming back to the UK in a couple of weeks' time. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, I'm travelling around. But what <laughs> I wanted to bring the point up about was um, about this war situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're being gaslighted towards it. And it's not ordinary people who profit from wars, but we pay the price. All my family have served in the military, my brother, uncles, father. And we would fight for our family or our community. But I don't think many people want to fight for these geopolitical struggles, you know, the Ukraine struggle, Taiwan or the Middle East. It's a different story today. But I think the answer, I, th I get what you're saying and I agree with you because I have lots of young people in our family that I talk to about this. But do you not think this story is because we are worried about war ending up on our doorstep rather than being in Taiwan? No, I think the point you made earlier that the war will not end up on our doorstep unless, unfortunately, it turns nuclear and then it's finished. It's end the game for all of us. So, but well, so, be... sorry, I was just going to um, interject and say, well, of course, Russia flexing its muscles, of course. We then have uh, the NATO countries and, of course, there have been new countries that have had accession into NATO. And, of course, under NATO's rules, uh, um, if one is attacked, then obviously it's an attack on all. So I, I think the risk of us being dragged into a war in Europe is significant. Um, I don't think that there was a Monroe Doctrine, wasn't there? After the uh, fall of the Soviet Union, they sort of they didn't have a treaty, but they agreed they wouldn't go further east. In fact, we have gone further east with NATO. And you Finland, are right. Poland, yeah. and Finland. So, so yeah. Russia, can you imagine the Cuban crisis when America threatened Russia with nuclear war if they did not withdraw from Cuba? Can you imagine the same situation? I think it's deeply concerning, actually. The whole thing I, is, yeah. I was just looking at the NATO borders. Finland is now 830 miles, that border, yeah. with Russia and is a NATO country, Estonia, a NATO country. Uh, we've also got Latvia uh, and Lithuania, um, all NATO countries. I mean, Article 7 would apply. I, 
Look, I think Grant Shapps is probably right. I and, hope he isn't. And it's interesting what you say about wars like Ukraine because we have a situation today where they've just elected unexpectedly um, a president in Ukraine, sorry, in Slovakia, who does not agree with supplying Ukraine with weapons and arms. So there is, a, there is a rhetoric around the world where people are getting unhappy about what's going on. The question is, where does that lead? Yeah. Absolutely right. Thank you very much for your call, Stephen. Uh, let's try and squeeze James in, who is in Coventry. Good morning to you. Morning. Well, morning. I think that we, this country here, we do too much trade with China. And so do other countries. Agreed. Everywhere you go, we're doing... And it's a bad thing, because China is... The stuff they make is not that good. I mean, they're improving on their stuff. But, you know, when they make something and it comes over here... You don't really get a guarantee with because they don't, they, and their workforce, the way they treat their workforce mm. is pretty bad. So, so, so should we stop buying goods from China? Yeah, I tell you why, because what China do is when they get our money, they put all their money into their military. That is what they do. Every penny they get goes into, they're trying to be the most powerful country in the world so they can do what they want. It's, a, know, so it, we, it's a very. Yeah, there's lots of other countries. We should give a lot of work to the Philippines. The Philippines, you know, they have work over there, like call centres, but we should give them more work. Oh, we should do it ourselves. Well, so, so it's a really interesting point that about China, of course, uh, and we've reported on this before, that in the event of a war, of course, any business would then have to be compliant with the regime and would have to support them. It's a really strong point. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, James. In Coventry, we're going to be talking after the break about all the latest political stories. I saw this this morning. The farmers' support, they traditionally tend to vote Conservative. There's an article, I think, in The Telegraph saying uh, support for the Tories is not a given. And we'll talk about that with Angus Walker after this break. Uh, don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, oh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. That was the woke that was 10 o'clock on Saturday night. We've got Lois Perry and Pete Barnes and the deputy leader of Reform UK's, our star guest, Ben Habib, and this useless bloody rabbit. <laughs> Very good morning to you. It's just after 8 o'clock now on Sunday, April the 7th. I'm David Bull. This is Weekend Breakfast. Thank you very much indeed for your company this morning. Now on this fine day, I have some great news for you. Of course I do. It is International Beaver Day today. Really? really? Yes. Uh, it's a day to celebrate uh, the cheeky rodents. Also, uh, today is no housework Dirty. day. Dirty. <laughs> Filth. <laughs> Filth. Uh, it's that simple. It's a time uh, where you don't have to do anything around the house and all you have to do is put your feet up sounds absolutely lovely to me also tonight is the london eurovision party you it's all being... laughed at me <laughs> it's being hosted in london how rude no a very big event london eurovision party current and former eurovision contestants showcase their songs tonight's headline act none other than ollie alexander representing the united kingdom in this year's eurovision song contest great news indeed Rene, stop yawning and uh, let's <laughs> Start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Oh, there are some good ones. On this day in 1739, English uh, highwayman Dick Turpin was hanged in York for murdering an innkeeper. Now, before becoming a highwayman, he had actually been a butcher's apprentice. On this day in 1827, chemist John Walker of Stockton-upon-Tees sold the world's first box of friction matches that he'd invented the previous year. Now, he charged one shilling for a box of 50 matches, and each box was supplied with a piece of sandpaper, which was then folded double, through which the match had to be drawn to ignite it. And my favourite one this morning, on this day in 1832, Joseph Thompson, a farmer, went to Carlisle to sell his wife. Uh, a large crowd actually gathered, and so he uh, had the initial opening. He put the price of the wife at uh, 50 shillings. Uh, <laughs> she didn't sell. So after an hour, he thought, I better drop the price. Uh, so he did. He dropped the price to 20 shillings. And to make sure he had a quick sale, he threw the dog in as well. And those are today's fascinating facts. I'm being offered £22.50 for you. For me? Yeah. Oh, I'll take it. I've agreed. Oh, I, <laughs> of course you have, of course. By the way, uh, on this, I've got some more. I've got oh. some more for you. On this day in 1853, Queen <clears throat> Victoria became the first monarch to receive chloroform. It was administered to ease the birth of her eighth child, mm. uh, Prince Leopold. And on this day in 1930, I, I just paying tribute to him, Andrew Sachs was born. Of course, he's very famous for playing Manuel in uh, Faulty <laughs> Towers, which I still think... Which would never be allowed today, and yet it was so funny. I mean, that episode with the Germans and I everything, know. I mean, it's just... It's for priceless. me, I always think of the duck. Do you remember the duck when he got his foot in the dark <laughs> before they cooked it? <laughs> and no, the psychiatrist as well. <laughs> Two doctors, yeah, so you were a doctor. Anyway, uh, and then on this day in 1986, Sir Clive Sinclair saw sold the rights to his machines to Amstrad. All happened on this very Which, of day. course, was Alan Sugar. Yes, it was. Mm. And, of course, Amstrad stands for Alan Michael Sugar. There you go. Did you know that? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah? So there you go. Uh, those are today's fascinating facts. We're talking about a number of things this morning. Uh, obviously, a lot of politics going on. Also, the front page of the Sunday Telegraph this morning saying, UK failing to prepare for war. This is according to ex-ministers uh, James Heapy uh, and various others also wading in. Ben Wallace also wading in. And uh, this is on the back of Grant Shapp saying that we are in a pre-war period. The question I want to ask this morning, how worried are 
are you about the threat of war? The number 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us. You can also text the word talk in your message to 87222. And you can also access uh, the wife's on it, aren't you? you I'm on, on it. Did I'm you bring it. it? Oh, you did. I did. Uh, you brought the iPad. Uh, you can access <coughs> at Talk TV, then leave a space, then hashtag uh, breakfast. In, in fact, in fact, um, Lady Loud Loudlu has said, Renee. You were thinking of Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, very similar. Still got it birds. wrong. It was wrong. <laughs> it was wrong. And, and Leighton says, well, how interesting it's National Beaver Day, the mind boggles. Thank you very much for that. Of course, uh, we're celebrating all things uh, exciting. Uh, let's now talk about uh, some political stories, shall we? Because they're dominating the headlines, even though they are in recess. Angus Walker, former ITM political correspondent and a government advisor, joins us now. Good morning to you. Good morning, David. How are you? Uh, yeah, good. Thank you very much indeed. Are you somewhere very glamorous? <laughs> You're in a car. Uh, welcome, to, welcome to my car studio. I'm on my way to the airport to pick up nearest and dearest since you asked. Oh, lovely, lovely. Um, so lots of political stories doing the round. Can I just start with this one in the Daily Telegraph this morning? And I found this really interesting. Farmers' support for the Tories is not a given, according to the head of the NFU. Apparently, the National Farmers' Union are very unhappy with the government. Uh, they have have essentially said historically of course farmers tend to support the Conservative Party that support is not a given anymore as we know dozens of tractors descended on Westminster last month to protest against what they said was a risk to food security caused by the cheap imports if they lose the farming vote that is a serious problem for the Conservative Party it is and you're right I mean traditionally you think that the Conservative Party does have strong support in you know in the in the shires uh in the rural areas it's not always true though i would just mm. caution a little bit if you look at areas of the country like the southwest for example uh you know a very rural part of the country largely dairy farming country uh strong streak of sort of independent thinking but for a long time that was a lib dem stronghold and you you had mps down in the southwest who effectively you know, walked and talked like Tories, uh, 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 sort of very moderate Tories, but actually were Lib Dem. So um, it's not always a given, but there has been interesting polling in the last few months, which shows that some of that support is falling away for the Tories in those areas. And I think there's always been a certain amount of angst between farmers and governments. I mean, remember there was, uh, you know, the, the the protests about the price of fuel uh, 20 or so years ago against the then Labour government, which came under a lot of pressure. There was friction between the Labour government over fox hunting and mm. the countryside. So there's always been a certain amount of pressure put on any government by the National Farmers Union. That's what the National Farmers Union is there to do. That's it doing its job. But I think if you look at the polling, there might be a deeper problem for the Tories in, in rural areas. And, and that's a, a beautiful segue into what I want to talk about next, because donors are essential to any political party. In the same article, it says Sirocco Forte, of course, the Brexit-backing hotel tycoon, is quite strong this, said the Conservatives deserve to lose the next election. He's given 130000 to uh, the Conservatives party in the past. He says under Rishi Sunak there is no clear sense of direction, only short-term fiddling, most leap for political effect and nothing to set the country on a more positive course. Now when you look at the YouGov polling that was done uh, on the 2nd and 3rd, this was the field work 2nd and 3rd of April, this mm. makes very grim reading for the Conservatives. They're yes. now at 20, Reform UK at 16, four points behind, and yes. Labour a whopping 43%. Yes, yes, and this is the MRP polling I think you're referring to. Well, the MRP David. is slightly different, but, but it's a very similar picture, yeah. OK, fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, all the polling consistently has shown that Labour, you know, streaking ahead in the polls. It's been solid now. I think when it comes to Rishi Sunak, though, imagine if the Tories were ahead in the polls, if you can imagine such a thing, everyone would probably be saying, oh, he's brilliant, he's this technocrat. <laughs> yes, he's yes, yeah. he's a bit boring, but he's a technocrat and he manages and he fixes things, he sorts things out, wins a framework, etc. And yet, I think what we're talking about, I think you have to rewind to sort of party gate. And when the, the British people basically decided they'd had enough of the Tories, Boris Johnson 
and we've just been in the Tories have been in terminal decline ever since and the polling has been so rigid in the gap that you, it, it only tells you the public have stopped thinking so I don't think there's much Rishi Sunak could really do and the polling seems to suggest that is the case Rishi Sunak is definitely a man under enormous pressure. Um, mm. There's an article in the Times saying Rishi Sunak is beginning to flag under the weight of those polls that we talked about. Harry yes. Cole, uh, my colleague at The Sun, interviewed Rishi Sunak the other night, actually, on yes. Wednesday it was. And he, right. he kind of pushed him and just made a joke about the fact he said, why are your trousers so short? And I think <laughs> Rishi Sunak, it kind of encapsulates for me Rishi Sunak generally. He didn't really know how to respond to that, and I, I understand that. But everything about Rishi Sunak obviously is under scrutiny, whether it's his leadership style, the way he dresses, whether he's in touch with the average man and woman in this country, because he is very, very wealthy, of course. And, and many people have said, well, look, he's just not very charismatic. He's a middle manager. Ha you're very experienced in this arena. Keir Starmer's not very charismatic either, I would say. How much, how important is it to have a charismatic leader, like someone like Boris Johnson or indeed Tony Blair? He was very charismatic. Yeah, it's absolutely essential. And you're right. You know, if you look back through history, the really successful political leaders in Britain have had that certain X factor. And even those who haven't and have tried to trade on the sort of, you know, not flash, just Gordon or Ian yes. Duncan Smith, which is, you know, the quiet man that just yeah. doesn't work. But you do need to have a certain spark of charisma, the sort of thing that Tony Blair had, for example, uh, or Bill Clinton, or Bo indeed Boris Johnson. It doesn't really matter where they come from. It's something about their character that cuts through. And actually, it comes down to simply the ability to communicate well. And it's something that Rishi Sunak, being a more technocrat-minded, uh, managerial-minded type of politician, doesn't quite mm. manage to portray and you're right neither does Keir Starmer if you look back to the polling again the polling clearly shows there's not huge enthusiasm for Keir Starmer that's not what's driving the Labour surge in the polls it's just that they're not the Tories and that's quite different from having a charismatic leader that is attracting voters to your party. I mean there's so much to talk about and we are in Perda because we have the local elections and the mayoral elections so I, I want to talk about both main parties here just in terms of the local elections I think it's well known that if if the Tories do very badly there may well be a vote of no confidence. What is also fascinating is that when you look at that polling Labour as you say it's not that people are particularly enthusiastic about Labour and in fact according to this they're losing urban liberals so they're losing that vote but they're gaining elsewhere so so the polls and the votes are in a state of flux yeah so i think uh, one thing that we've learned over the last few years especially since uh, 2016 is that the, the electorate is very volatile but i always uh, remind myself that the you know british voters are not stupid and i think that they are waiting for their moment to be able to tell the tories give the tories a massive telling off for mm -hmm. party gate and the handling of that and i think that is a latent force within uh, the electorate at the moment but i think that yeah you're getting to a point where the 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 the, the, the voter the voters apparently are so static there's nothing really any party can do to really shift it that much at the moment of course the ultimate uh, poll is the ballot box in, indeed. Can we talk about Angela Rayner? Because Rene and I were talking yeah. about this this morning. It, it has come back. So so there is now this article in the Mail this morning saying they, they now have proof that Angela Rayner has been lying. Now, obviously, she's, this is all about the sale of that house. And she said her primary residence uh, was in one place in Vicarage Road, um, but she'd got married. And she said she didn't live with her husband for five years, I think, in another property. She made £48,000 profit and as her primary residence which she said it was she therefore didn't pay capital gains on it also they're speculating she got a single person discount uh, from council tax now this story is not going away at all she bought under the margaret thatcher right to buy scheme which she has subsequently criticized and wants to get rid of but also just just the optics of this we both feel that this story might still run and it might uh, be her undoing your thoughts yeah, my thoughts are, I mean, on one hand, you've got a newspaper which is no fan of the Labour Party going for the deputy, deputy leader and, and wanting to continue 
the story and make sure that the story continues to run. So I think you have to put it in context. But the one thing about being a politician at a very, very senior level is you've got to be someone who is associated with the answers. You can't be someone who is constantly surrounded by questions. I'm not a tax expert or a lawyer. So, I mean, you really need to dig into the details of this story, actually. But the fact to, to actually work out whether there is some wrongdoing or not, and I don't know if there has been, but the fact is, you know, we see throughout history again and, and political history, people like Peter Mandelson, for example, or even David Blunkett, if you go back to those years, once they're surrounded by questions on a regular basis, it usually ends in tears. For her, and, and obviously, as you rightly say, of course, the, the male is no fan of Labour, but they have got some very detailed analysis. It also shows the perils of social media, uh, as far as I can see, because what they've done is they've looked at furniture that was in Vicarage Road. That furniture appears to be in the secondary residence, as do the children's toys and so on. So I suppose, and this goes back to the Will Rag question as well, just be very careful what you do on social media if you're in the, in the limelight and if you're a high-profile politician. Yes, I mean, you know, I think a lot of politicians will refer back to what David Cameron said about Twitter, which I won't repeat. But, um, yeah, it, 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 you know, social media now uh, offers journalists so many opportunities to do a bit of sleuthing. I mean, there's another big story in one of the papers today about the black box inside a hire car, which apparently tracks a suspect in a murder case, and they've been unpicked the entire story thanks to that. So there's all sorts of basically what we're talking about is electronic evidence that can be dug up now and if politicians have um social media accounts and they use them then uh, you know journalists and the public will go back through the history of their feeds and have a, a really good look you are being tr we are all being tracked so much by our social history and people can look back and see uh, what we've been up to in previous years so um, uh, you know, many politicians have come undone because of this. Absolutely. A salutary lesson to all involved <laughs> in politics. I shall take note. Thank you very much indeed, Angus. Really good to talk to you. That's Angus Walker there, former ITM political correspondent and government advisor. Yes, and we have some immediate feedback on that interview. Please. So we have Steve who says that Angus Walker is wrong. Oh. It's because the public have not stopped thinking about politics that one of the greatest upsets for a generation is going to take place. It's the old story. The elite think they know best. We have our vote it is for us to decide agreed and he's also right the ultimate poll is election day and also when a pollster leaps on you and says how are you going to vote do people tell the truth that's the other thing and they're listening they're thinking about people around them listening Indeed. you know we saw that when trump won people weren't prepared to say they were going to vote for him we saw it in brexit we people did see were, it in brexit. were not prepared to say they were going to vote brexit no it's fascinating and even those exit polls when you go to the polling <laughs> station and people come up to you and say how do you vote i invariably lie do you? Yeah. No, I don't. Well, it, dep it depends. Well, actually, I vote by post now, so I don't oh, have to enough. tell anyone. But Well, well that's a whole other story, isn't it? it? Is, yeah. Actually, about whether we should allow postal votes going forward and, and so on. Uh, right, thank you very much indeed for the moment, Randy. Honestly, politics is so fascinating at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're on recess. <laughs> Wait till they come back. Uh, right, let's move on. Uh, after the break, it's our future politics uh, panel. Joining us this morning, Nawal Abdi Samad, also Ben Cope. Uh, that will be a very interesting watch. That's all still to come. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Back to Weekend Breakfast Time, 8.24 now, Sunday, April the 7th. You're on fire this morning. Lots and lots of messages coming in. Uh, Fee, good morning to you in Cheshire. Fee says, David, do not forget that Angela Rayner was not at the Curry Gate party. Sorry, yes, she was <laughs> at the Curry Gate party, but she forgot she was there. Um, not lying, just a very bad memory. Honestly, David, these politicians really <coughs> think we are all stupid. Uh, Anthony says, Tony Blair's biggest asset was that he knew how to con the electorate. In fact, three times, thus the mess he left behind for Reform UK to sort out. Other parties are available, of course. We are in Perda. Farmers voted for Brexit. We were talking about, actually, the farmers. Uh, the Conservatives cannot take the vote from the farmers uh, for granted. The farmers do tend to vote uh, Conservative. But the farmers, uh, according to Anne, she said, well, look, they voted for Brexit and we haven't had a proper Brexit. So it's no surprise that the farmers vote for the Tories is not a given a great message there as well. And Adrian Baird, good morning to you. Adrian says that the date of the next general election could be earlier than commentators are expecting because sooner or later, Rishi will work out the electorate is not listening and the Tories are losing more and more support as time goes on. I mean, if they if he hasn't worked out right now well, that the electorate are not listening... I mean, that same article about the trousers that I mentioned earlier, it just says that Rishi Sunak is just so despised and he's really tired and he's really snappy at people. Bless him. And, well, I don't blame him. Poor little cherub. It's tough. I mean, I, I'm, I'm now putting myself in his He has no shoes. one to blame but himself, David. Come on. If he'd have actually listened I'm, to the I'm people... I'm being impartial and independent. I know. <laughs> but if he'd have listened to the people a little bit more and stopped trying to put plasters on things that needed a lot more than plasters... Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's a great line about the fact that, that Number 10 just doesn't know what which fire to fight first. Right, let's move on. It's time for our Future Politics panel. <laughs> The Future Politics Panel. Well, joining us this morning, I'm delighted to say, Nawal uh, Abdi Samad, who is a City University student and political commentator. Joining her is Ben Cope, political writer and commentator. Very smart, both of them. Good morning to you. Good, Good morning. morning. Nice to see you. It's your first time with us, so it thank is. you very much indeed uh, okay. for coming in. We had quite a passionate conversation, I think it's fair to say, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> we did. We did. It started in makeup uh, <laughs> and it continued throughout uh, the day. Let, let, on the subjects we're about to tackle, on the so same I'm going to sit back. So I'm just going if you could refrain yes. yourself just for the moment. So let's start with this. It's six months, actually, today since the start of the Israel-Gaza war. We talked a great deal yesterday about the way the politics is shaping up. Now, uh, Rishi Sunak has said the United Kingdom continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security. He also tacks onto this, he said the nation remains appalled by the deaths of three British aid workers in the IDF strike this week. 
He's gone further, actually. He's now saying we need a humanitarian pause. He goes on to talk about a ceasefire as well. We've also seen the Foreign Office being pushed into announcing a Royal Naval ship to go and to give aid to people in Gaza. It's thought there are now 1.8 million people who are desperately in need of food. The Foreign Office has given £9.7 million for aid equipment and expertise to help an international effort to establish a maritime aid corridor between Cyprus and Gaza. Cameron has also said, so we're getting kind of mixed messages because, um, so Rishi Sunak is saying Israel has the right to defend itself, but David Cameron is saying Israel, the, the support for Israel is not unconditional. Look, it's a very emotive issue what is going on. What, what are your thoughts as the conflict unfolds? Yeah, I still can't believe it's been six months since the horrific attacks on Israel in back in October 7th. Um, you know, I just... I genuinely believe that the world changed forever, forever. But I feel Do like, you? yeah, I feel like. But why is it taken three British, seven foreign aid workers to die? But there's been over thirty thousand, over thirty, over thirty-three thousand Palestinians killed. Thirteen thousand children, according to Hamas. According yes. to Hamas, thirteen thousand children, um, seventeen thousand, seventy-six thousand injured. I just can't believe it's taken now. Um, a humanitarian aid and the upholding of international humanitarian aid um, law. I don't know why it's taken only so seven thousand for, for the world to. to so, so you to make you make a really interesting point, actually, and I think you're right. Uh, Hamas says thirty-three thousand deaths in Gaza. We've we believe one hundred and twenty-nine hostages still yeah. being held, thirty-four presumed dead. I mean, on, on every level, it's absolutely horrific what's going on. Um, that's a really brilliant point, though. It, has it just taken us, the deaths of foreigners, to wake up and actually say, look, we've got to sort this out. There's a meeting happening today, actually, to try and broker a peace deal. Um, where are you in this conflict? What are your thoughts? So I, th I think sort of me, and like a lot of people, have been on a bit of a journey since you know October, October the 7th, six months ago. We all, we all saw the you know, absolutely abhorrent acts that, that happened that day. And I think we, a lot of people felt that particularly then Israel did have a right to you know try and get Hamas out of Gaza but there does seem to be a sense that over the, over these last six months that well I think most people would agree that they are that Israel are probably going too far many would say they are committing war crimes and even though Israel are and continue to be an ally I think we, we do have to look at ourselves and think, you know, at what point do we allow an ally to... to Just before I on? unleash Rene, um, because I feel that she might have something different to say on that. I'm just going to add to that, of course, that there are there are a lot of um, a lot of um, things that have happened in the past. So the, the government be is believed to have legal advice saying that Israel has broken humanitarian law and hasn't announced it. This is Alicia Kearns, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Uh, the ICJ ruling saying Israel must act without delay to allow aid into Gaza, which is now uh, appearing to happen after the United States lent on Israel as well. Um, is that, is that the feeling amongst people that, and you started this conversation by mm. saying it was horrific what happened and Israel had the right to respond. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I think people have been on a journey. Just amongst younger people, which I am not one, but mm. amongst younger people, has the mood changed towards Israel? Yeah, I think the mood has changed. I think everyone obviously believes that Israel has the right to defend it, uh, to defend itself and self-defense. However, self-defense isn't really blowing up hospitals or um, well, they, up they, they, they would say the reason they've done that is because the terrorists have embedded themselves in Al Shifa yeah. Hospital, and we've seen two hundred. Exactly. Um, so, so they would say that that is a, 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 a military target. Where I think people struggle is when you've got people who are desperate for food, who are in Gaza, 1.8 million we now believe, yeah. who are then told to move south, then they're told to move north, and um, and it's a humanitarian crisis. No, 100%. You know, um, the UN General Secretary said that Gaza is a graveyard for children, so I can only imagine what's going on you know in the ground you know and I, I know that um there's um many children are facing you know um amputations you know of their legs their legs are being amputated their arms are being amputated um so you know it's very desire it's very outrageous what's happening there and i think that's what a lot of people can relate to a lot of people can relate to something has to happen and that's why i think the I think, protests i think that is are going right, on. doctor i do but what i wonder is why we are so critical of this particular war when in yemen since 2016 
85,000 children have died in that civil war. There are 17 million people starving in Yemen because aid can't get in. So we're, I just find the hypocrisy of suddenly, suddenly the world has woken up apparently to Gaza when there are people dying as we speak from the same things, Muslim children, in these, in mm. these, but nobody says. But a is, word. It, is, nobody it pro- is it the proximity? The because no, Israel's it's because right. it's Israel. I think, I think it's because UK and the US are both sending millions and millions of billions of pounds worth of weaponry. So it's our taxpayers' money that's killing innocent children and killing. Do you people. know where most so I think of that weaponry goes? Do you think no. it goes to, to no, but so, so it's not point, in terms no. of our arms sales. It's not point four percent of our arms sales. So yeah. we are so, we are selling arms to Israel, but not much. Yeah. But Germany, not much. But but is but but certainly America is. Yeah, Germany, Italy, and US are sending so much, which is why we're in disbelief that but, we're sort of directly. The Most of it was into Qatar. But Where that, do we but, think that goes? But that's a really interesting point, which is the immediacy. So it has brought that back to people in this country. It, and Rennie's point is also valid, which is that we it is double standards in that you've got people dying in other countries, but suddenly we're all focused on Israel and Gaza. Is it because it's reported far more, which it is actually in this country? Um, what is it? Or is it the deaths of British nationals? I think the, the the reporting sort of issue is is, is, is definitely important. I, I I think the main the main point is, is is because Israel is an ally, so we are seen to to back up that state. We are backing up Saudi Arabia that is killing people in Yemen. But they're not an ally. We're sending them more so, arms than we are to Israel. I, I let's stay. I just want to stay away mm. from Yemen because it gets starts to get very complicated <laughs> indeed. Carry on. So I I, I think that. That, that sort of close partnership that we have and continue to have with Israel is, 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 is why that this is, this is so sort of difficult for the United Kingdom because we, we feel like we've got this, this friend in a, in a region where we don't have that many friends and that that friend is, is starting nor, to nor behave does poorly. does Israel have many friends I think, I think I'm shocked and it's quite striking now that there's a sudden shift from both the media and government to say now is enough. Why is it now enough? Mm-hmm. Why was it not the th- yes, thousands of people that died? Very it's a Why brilliant it point. It, it, Why it, now? it is a brilliant point. Also, that, that brings me nicely onto this. Israel's military says it's recovered the body of a man taken hostage and held in Gaza. This is Elad Katzir. He was taken from a kibbutz uh, during the attacks. Uh, his body is now being brought back to to Israel. He, he was 47 years old. He was abducted with his mother, Hannah. She he was then released. What what then transpires is his sister, Karmit uh, Palti Katzir, actually has gone further and blamed Israeli authorities for her brother's death, saying that actually Israel should have compromised. They should have got re- those uh, 129 remaining hostages released. We're seeing that. We're also seeing tens of thousands of Israelis rallying in Tel Aviv, demanding the hostages are released. So more and more of these going on. Is do you, I mean, uh, we're not there, but do you get a sense that actually... Rather, this is now becoming Netanyahu's personal problem and that, that support for Netanyahu himself is falling away. Yeah, 100%. I think he is too... I think, he, obviously, he's a prime minister, so it's all fundamentally lies on him. But not just him. The war cabinet is not just him. But, yeah, it's not just him. I think if we're going to topple him or if everyone's angry at him, it shouldn't just be directed at him because it's not... It doesn't take... It's not just him that did it. It's also the there is a question here from moment. from um, one of our viewers for you guys, which yeah. I'm just going to hand over to you. I'm not going to answer it. It just says, can the panel please confirm how they propose Israel defends itself if there's a ceasefire today? Because Hamas are not going to stop. So I, I think that the, the West should continue to back them, but should be putting pressure to, to, to Israel. That I, I, I think it is an unrealistic expectation that Israel individually sort of gets rid of Hamas in in Gaza I think that it should be kind of an international coalition because you know clearly you know Netanyahu and many Israelis do have an understandable sort of personal vendetta against Hamas and I, I don't think it's a, it's a viable solution for, for sort of that group to be in charge of trying to to, to get them out so so, so uh... One of the things that we had a slight disagreement about, let's just say, put it mildly, um, was that um, many people have said that Israel has the right to continue until Hamas is completely removed from Gaza. Now, the problem with that is I don't think they'll ever do that. I don't think it's actually possible to do that. And, of course, what we're seeing, uh, CIA CIA Director Bill Burns and the Qatari Prime Minister Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani will join negotiators from Egypt, Israel and Hamas. Now... 
How can you trust Hamas when they are complicit in that terrible attack? And I think this goes back to the point about Israel. Israel is kind of stuck in a very difficult position here where they are trying to essentially defend their own territory. But at the same time, now we're negotiating with, with terrorists. Well, I didn't think we, well, certainly in the United Kingdom, we don't have a policy. We have a policy of saying we don't negotiate with terrorists. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I honestly can't wait to see how that unfolds because none of us can predict or take the word of Hamas. But so, how do Israel defend themselves? Because they are. I just. I think attack. by stopping the bombing by immediate ceasefire. Because but then what happens when Hamas but, attack again, which but, they've said they will? Repeatedly. But how far will Israel go? Will will they kill? Them? I think it's the ethnic cleansing that's happening. The, the, but that's the killing not of all the, the Palestinians. What do Israel do when Hamas come across the border again? I think stop the defence for now and stop it. So, so, is, so is just going on to that, uh, yeah. is, is the answer a two-state solution, which Hamas doesn't want and Israel doesn't want actually, but is that the answer? Is it actually, uh, is it an intractable problem because actually it was the way that Israel was brought about? Uh, is it the building in the West Bank, for example? Are we able to solve this? I don't think we'll be able to solve this. Perhaps mm. I think the closest thing we'd get to that is a two-state mm. um, yeah, two state thing. But also, Israel is an occup occupying power, so it's going to be very hard to sort of negotiate and what's going to be on the tables for that. Because mm. Hamas is going to have its thing. And There's, then, Cooperman says here the myopic focus on Gaza is down to one thing rabid anti Semitism. People can be killed elsewhere and not a word because it's not being I, I don't out agree. by Israel. I, I don't agree. I think, I think it's been brought to the fore because of the amount of coverage that's, that's taking place. But also, I don't think you can ignore 1.8 million people who are, being, who are starving. And, and that's why we're now sending why are they foreign. Starving. Because well, we know why they're starving because the aid isn't getting through. But we don't know exactly why. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say that Hamas is taking that aid, which they are. They are. They're but selling equally, it in markets. But equally, but equally, doctor, it was not until the United States put pressure on Netanyahu that he opened more uh, border crossings. More, but there was plenty. There was aid getting through. Also, some aid, not some enough. Two hundred lorries a day. Not enough. No. Not enough. Two hundred lorries a day. Not and enough. Also, why is aid opening up now? I thought it was it was closed. Why is Israel uh, confirmed that it? was sending aid now but now it's opening aid so it doesn't make sense no, no, can, can I, can I, I, I just want to move on to one yeah. other thing just very quickly because it's a really important point this is in the telegraph this morning only one in four british muslims believe that hamas committed murder and rape in israel on october the 7th 46 percent of british muslims said they sympathize with hamas according to a poll commissioned by the henry jackson society just over half of british muslims want to make it illegal to show a picture of the prophet Muhammad, which is a slight attack but what i find interesting is that younger, well-educated Muslims were the most likely to think Hamas mm. did not commit the atrocities. I'm shocked. Are you? I am shocked. I wasn't appalled. shocked. I am I'm... shocked by the belief, but I wasn't actually shocked by the poll. I was shocked by the poll because I because we're young, educated. We saw it. We, there's yeah. no denying the videos that circulated mm. on October seventh. You can see um, the kidnapping. You can mm. see you can't see the rape, but I'm not going to deny rape. If someone said they were raped, then yeah. you know, they've been raped. But I'm very shocked. I thought young, educated people would see for themselves that that can't. That, that's so interesting. There's no denying so what's that happening? actually. Yes, what is happening? Because because I do get the sense that there are there are is a subsection of Muslims, British Muslims, mm. who do not believe it. I'm shocked, I don't know. I think they're perhaps need to be educated, but then they are educated, so is it... Is yeah, it yeah. But is it, is it because they're being taught in, in, in mosques, for example? Yeah. Is, it, is it because you're being given a, no, a certain I, narrative? I, no, I don't think so. I don't think that we're being pushed anything in mosques. I think mosques are just holy places where we pray. But yeah. I digress. I think we're going back to the topic. I think mm. the reason why... I think perhaps they're seeing videos on Twitter or on social media of dead, dead children, dead babies, dead yeah. mothers, yeah. and they're trying to put that they're trying to sympathise with Hamas. Without the detail, maybe. Without, without the true facts. Without maybe. the true facts, they're trying to they're trying to see that and then trying to have so a blame. So it's a visceral and then, reaction. I think it's a visceral That's reaction. really interesting. Yeah. Fayaz Mughal, and she founded the interface group, uh, told Mama Faith Matters Muslims Against Anti-Semitism. Sorry, he uh, said the findings also agreed with you. Said mm. the findings are actually shocking, but also not shocking. Mm. Um, it, it's it's a problem because we're all British. Yep, it certainly is. I think um, I think it, it, it does reveal a sort of an extent of sort of anti-Western ideology in, in in some senses, where it, it, it's seen as you know is, is Israel being an ally that that, that we are supporting mm -hmm. them. And I think you can so you can see it both in what's happening in Gaza and also in support for sort of Yemeni Houthis. I think that was um, it is all really really concerning. I don't think we're going to solve it this morning. 
There's a really interesting quote actually here mm -hmm. that's really interesting from Musa Hassan Youssef, mm -hmm. who is the son of the leader of Hamas, who oh, yeah. I think is, is now estranged from his father, to put it into context, saying, having spent 10 years secretly fighting against Hamas, I know it's a global threat, an ideological monster that wants to dominate the world. The Israelis who were abducted on October 7th are not the only... Um, victims. We are all hostages of Hamas as they continue to manip manipulate the world for their own ends. The leaders of Hamas are con men who use Palestinians to become richer and more powerful. They don't care about the Palestinian people. The children of Gaza, Gaza are sitting in despair and poverty while the leader of Hamas and their families enjoy expensive jewellery, luxury hotels. As the war started on October 7th, kills thousands. They use women, children and people of human shields of all nationalities. Yeah, I just wish... October 7th never happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I honestly Absolutely. wish it never happened. Cause and actually, I think that's the point, isn't it? I think mm. these people are the victims of people who don't care about any of us. Mm. Mm. I think yeah. it's, it's strange how sort of support for, for Palestinians and, and, and Gaza has, has almost risen, you know, in, in a sort of inverse correlation between how sympathetic, you know, the, the politics of, of Gaza is. Because, you know, it, I, I think most would say that Hamas has become more powerful and got worse in recent years. So it's, it, it, it's concerning that, that now is the time when they sort of have maximum support. Mm. Yeah. A very constructive conversation, if I may say. Thank you very much for the moment. Let's uh, take a break. After the break, uh, we're going to continue. We've got other uh, stories that we want to talk about. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
back to Weekend Breakfast. A very constructive uh, conversation, I thought, before the break. We're in the middle of our Future Politics panel. Joining us this morning, Nawal Abdi Samad uh, and also Ben Cope. Let's move on and talk about this front page on the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, start reading, indeed. The UK failing to prepare for war, says X. Ministers. This is James Heapy, the former Armed Forces Minister. He says only officials from the Ministry of Defence actually bothered to take part in an exercise to find out how the country would be governed from the UK's wartime bunker. Uh, his comments were backed by Ben Wallace, the former Defence Secretary, who said there were too many people in government relying and hoping the current instability would go away. This comes on the back of Grant Shapp saying we're in a pre-war period. Now, in the Cold War, Britain had a set of national plans, the government war book, detailing how the country would transition from peace to war. And he says that, quite frankly, we have not prepared for this in the slightest, and we need to. What, when you read this article, what were your initial thoughts? I was, uh, in some senses, almost frustrated by the... Because I think this is... Um, we, we've seen so many stories like this of, for whatever reason, whether whether it's the army's too small, defence budgets being cut. Yep. In some senses, we're, we're we're not ready for you know a, a defensive war, and you know I, I, I'm not sure any of these any of these conversations are actually particularly where we were saying constructive. I don't think they are particularly constructive because they're so. There's so, there's so much that you could simply can't say about war readiness to the to the general public that I don't see how useful it is in kind of elements of them being leaked to the press. And the second point isn't here it, is... Isn't it to focus minds in government? Well, perhaps, but, you know, the, the, the stuff is in the press to to generate pressure from the public and, you know, inter interested mm. parties. And But those parties don't... You know, it, only the government has sufficient information here. So I don't see why... You, uh, why wouldn't this be something you try and lobby for internally? Well, I think they may well have done, and they've decided that to resort to this because nothing else has uh, has changed. Ben Wallace echoes the call for the government to raise its game. I think this is deeply concerning. The growing instability and insecurity in Britain and her allies means we actually need to make a step change towards recognising that our core duty is to think about defence and its resilience. As a young person... Uh, and we were talking about this earlier. When I was growing up, we we knew about war. We were warned about nuclear war. I mean, we were told to hide in a cupboard, which was a pretty useless. Or under a table. Or under a table. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Um, how worried are you as a young person that actually war is much closer? I think very worried. I mean, we're already fighting the war on disinformation. We've got TikTok everyone's relying on, which is obviously Chinese run. So, yeah, I think we're all sort, sort of very worried, but we don't know what to do. And I feel like the UK can't even fix potholes. So I think we've got bigger, <laughs> bigger things to... So, so that's really interesting. You feel really impotent, impotent in, yeah. in the whole of this. What does that make? So, what do you do about that? What does anyone do, or do we just do we carry on and just ignore it and hope it goes away? No, we don't ignore it. I think we just sort of put pressure on the government to actually do something, or you know, sign petitions. I think everyone's doing petitions nowadays to put that in the agenda for government. Do you think that? we just know so much more because of 24-hour social media newspapers change their headlines 15 times a day whereas it was once you pick up your newspaper that would be it mm. do you think that actually exaggerates these threats or do you think they're real in, in this instance i i don't think social media really has has, has a role here because so much of this is is secret and private mm. we you know we, we don't have the sort of the drip feed scandals like we do in in most other sort of policy areas that you know we we just occasionally have a, a sort of a, a leak from you know whether it's whether or some statement from an army official or whoever saying that we're not ready so you know in in its subtext being we want more money and then what, what, what is the public meant to do about that i mean when you read this and it goes on to talk about that various government uh, officials have got uh, places in the bunker and places to work i think it brings down the reality of war and actually i do think we need to be prepared i think we need to increase our spending gdp on defense and i think also we need to be prepared for conscription because i think it could happen let's just talk very quickly if we can about angela rayner because uh, this is a very interesting story i've talked about it incessantly this morning about the fact she had a primary residence which was in Vicarage Road. She said she lived there. She was married and her children and husband were in another house not very far away. She made £48,500 profit. She bought under Margaret Thatcher's right to buy scheme which she herself said she would get rid of and we think she uh, also benefited from a, claiming a single person's allowance in terms of council tax. 
It doesn't look great, does it? No, it doesn't. No, I think I was reading, I think it was a Daily Mail, their front page, and it was her sort of taking pictures of her inside the house. And £48,000 profit is a lot of money. It is. So and no tax, you see. And no because tax, it, yeah. Because it's the primary residence. But, but you see, what the Daily Mail has done is they've looked at her furniture and soft toys, mm. and she posted it all herself. <laughs> and also, it's the things that she said. So she has said things like, I'm just home. get home from yeah. work and the cat's on my lap in five minutes. Yeah. Now, that's not someone else's house. That's your house. But so so those so the same cuddly toy is in the other house. Mm. Um, so do you think actually that um, she can survive this? I think she's a hypocrite. I think people will see her as sort of hypocrite because what you said about Thatcher, you know, she wanted to quit, you know, quit and then now she's doing the exact same things that she would have. I think a lot of people, it will be in their minds for, for a long time. Um, especially. I think I, I take the other view here in that I've been, I, I think it's really interesting how, how th this just hasn't landed, I think, with the general public, because I, I think it, it is pretty clear. It's come back. Well, uh, but, uh, but, you know, if, if you if you polled a thousand people, how many of them would be able to, sort of, one, recall this and, and then two, accurately describe what's happened She's here? going to be Deputy Prime Minister and if this is true, that's fraud. I, I entirely agree that it doesn't it doesn't look good if, if if like us you read sort of every line in a newspaper but I, I I don't think people do and I think so two two things that I think we can take away here I think one it just shows that for a scandal to really be a scandal it has to be so simple that everyone can understand I think sort of party great was a great example of that and then I think the second thing is that if um well, I, I think sort of people essentially just sort of don't want to hear it from the Conservatives right now. They, 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 they've almost sort of wasted this sort of real bombshell thing that they, they might have actually been better to wait until I, government... I don't think it was the Conservatives. It was uh, the Mail on Sunday, actually, that did this. And then they went... They trawled her own social media. Do you mm. think she can survive it? Is her position tenable? Um, I think that she can't survive it. I think it will be always be in the back of people's minds, those pictures and her sort of flaunting, you know the same furnitures and everything so I think no I don't think it'll it be does something. seem like one rule for one type of person mm. and of course as you mentioned earlier there was also the beer gate yes oh yes I forgot there. she of course said what she wasn't there at that beer gate with Keir Starmer and then oh no COVID. she forgot she was actually she there. was yeah so if MPs are gonna lie or say that they were there when okay. they went there or when, when Ben they finally there. can she survive this yes that's it. That's yes. it. I think. We'll, I think. I think this will. This will blow over, and cons the Conservatives are waste opportunity when they could have waited and dealt more damage later. Though. Come on, Doctor. No. What? No. You're saying no, really. Mm. I, don't right. think she will. I just think there's too much now and as um, Angus said earlier there's too many questions around her all of the time I also say no that's three one unfortunately <laughs> you lose uh, right thank you very much to both of you for coming in that's uh, Noel Abdi Samad and also Ben Cope that was today's Future Politics panel The Future Politics panel <laughs> This is when we prove wrong but anyway <laughs> yeah. uh, Chris uh, joins us from Surrey good morning to you Morning, Dodgers. Morning. Um, yes, she goes. She's a liar. It's fraud. And uh, I don't think the country will stand for it at the end of the day. So, um, can I just ask you, Ben said it's not high on people's priority. Is it? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, talking to my friends, uh, yes, it is. It's uh, very much... Uh, I, get, I receive WhatsApps from loads of mates, jokey ones, you know, the ones that you couldn't possibly put up on TV. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. And and so so also this this as we were talking about uh, the curry gate as well. Here we go. Drip 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 drip. Keir Starmer is also standing by Angela Rayner, which I think might be a bit of a mistake. Well, he didn't do much as the head of the CPS did he so uh, <laughs> Um, let's be fair, he, he, should have, he should have the intelligence to know that people are not going to stand for that, whether it's prosecutable or not. Um, it, it, it sticks in the craw. OK. But that's not what I... That's not oh, what sorry, I right, for. come on then. <laughs> right. Um, our 1939 moment. Defence spending should be increased to 3% immediately. Yeah. And it should be increased 1% a year to 5%. Because the, the the immediate danger is not now. The, the danger is in two to three years' time. Now, something that people don't all, don't it is not covered by the mainstream media, as Putin did in Dolotesk, um, He has he has um, non-recognisable uniformed soldiers in Moldova. Yep. That's not part of NATO that have scythed off a lump of country and declared an, ind an independent state. So he's ready to go again, and he won't stop there. 
Um, I would agree. I would we, agree with we, that. We need we need to sh- show that we are serious. But if you if if Putin dares to put a foot into another country, all right, uh, that we, World War Three will start. So because. Mm. Because Moldavia is not a member of NATO. There are a couple of other countries around there that aren't members uh, that he will do first. But make no mistake, he wants the Balkans. He wants Lithuania, uh, Latvia and Estonia. So, well, so, so yeah. Latvia is in NATO. Lithuania is in NATO. I've got a very I, helpful... I don't agree. I think he just wanted those those seaports that he's got with the Donbass. And I think... I, I, I think he... He thinks he's invincible. I, I think he believes we know about the reunification of Mother Russia. I That's think he's seen how hard is. it's been to conquer Ukraine. <laughs> I think he <laughs> will keep, when it finally settles, I think he will keep those eastern seaports and the bits that he wanted and he will then retreat. I don't believe he will march through Europe. I don't think Ukraine will settle for him having those. Um, I think they might have to. Mm. Um, I, I think if... I think if they do, that will embolden him to have a go elsewhere. You have to you have to think of it from his point of view. All right. Since the the fall of the um, the inner German land border and the Berlin Wall, yeah, um, he's seen NATO increase oh, exponentially. Absolutely. And he he has said on TV when he was interviewed. And it's there on it's there you can YouTube it up. He has said that the worst day of his life was the fall of the USSR. See, and that goes back to what I said. Yeah. Uh, you know, his doctrine is the, the reunification of Mother Russia. You know, we've talked a great deal about whether he is actually truly well as well. A uh, really good call. Thank you very Thank you. much uh, indeed. Chris, time is tight, but let's try and squeeze Graham in. Good morning. Hello. Hello, morning. hi, hi. What point would you like to make this morning? that I recommend everybody look at an excellent paper by the Civitas think tank called Inadvertently Arming China, which talks extensively for 100 pages about the work that our universities are doing with China, which is defence-related. And I believe that needs to stop us immediately. Yeah, I think people like Ian Duncan Smith would agree with you uh, actually I, on I, that. But I, unfortunately, there's people like David Cameron who think that everything's hunky dory. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much for that call as well. Uh, we talked about that earlier as well. The rise of China, of course, the uh, the implication of having China involved in pretty much every aspect of life in this country and include security services and, as we said, Huawei and all the rest of it. And, and as I said, I don't think it's a brilliant idea to have China owning nuclear power stations in this country. But what do I know? Uh, right. Right, still loads more still to come now. It's Sunday, so it's our Sunday surgery. So if you have a medical problem that you need some help or advice with, do call in. We're also going to be talking through some other medical stories and we're going to be talking about why are so many young people getting cancer? Uh, a really important question that we will answer after this break. This is Talk TV. We're broadcasting live from central London. Don't go anywhere. Thank you, guys. This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go, Graham. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid. 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hello, friend. Good morning to you. It's just after nine o'clock now on Sunday, April the 7th. I'm David Bull. This is Weekend Breakfast. Great news if you are just waking up this morning. Yes, it is International Beaver Day today. Really? Yes, it really is. Really? Really, yes, really. A day to celebrate the cheeky rodents. Also, it's no housework day. Dirty. Yeah. Filth. <laughs> uh, it's that simple. Dirty and filth. Yes, it's a time uh, where you don't have to do anything around your home. All you have to do is put your feet up. Sounds very good to me. Also, today is London Eurovision party. It's you been... all laughed at me. <laughs> I don't know what he's on to this morning. Um, London Eurovision party, which is being hosted in London. Current and former Eurovision contestants will showcase their songs. And the headline act this evening is Ollie Alexander, of course, who is representing the United Kingdom. Now, you I'm... all laughed at me. We did all laugh at you. Uh, Ollie Alexander, it's a really good song, actually. I wonder if it will do well. I know Nil Eurovision. Quoi. It's a really good song, Nil Doctor. Quoi. It's a really good song. Be quiet. <laughs> it's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to today's fascinating facts, and then you can talk. <laughs> today's fascinating facts. <laughs> and cue Dr. Rene. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yeah. By the way, stop. Eurovision, what? Neil Park. Neil Park. Have you heard the song? Doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Mm. Oh, why? Because everyone hates us. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. And it is deeply yeah, political. Nothing to do with the song at all. No, it's a really good song, actually. I really like it. And I like Ollie Alexander. I think he's very talented. Watch his well get Neil Poir as well. All right. Um, OK, so 1739. Yes. Dick Turpin was hanged. Yes. And somebody told us, I'm going to add in here, oh. very early on, so I'll never find it now. Right. Somebody told us about an inn along the way called the Thumb and Jam, or Jam and Thumb, something like that. It wasn't It wasn't that, it was something else. It but was, yeah. was, Was it, it was. Thumb and Jam? Yes. Oh, right, OK. And it was because apparently Dick Turpin, there was a con man, convinced the landlady to jam in her thumb and her finger, something like that, so that he could get two different ales and not pay. You might want to find that message. Do you want me to find it? Do you <laughs> really think, want me I to find it? I think the name of the pub is wrong, it. but anyway. OK, but it was something... Here yeah. you go, I've got it. The Ram Jam. Told you. Rammed in Ram her thumb jam and jammed in, in yes. her finger. Yeah, Ram Jam. There you go. Very good. Then, oh, God, I've put myself off my flow now. Yeah, next. 1820? Seven. 1827, mm. OK. Someone called Walker... John Walker. ...was a chemist. And uh, he invented the first matchbox. He he did. Friction matches, yes, indeed. That's very clever, isn't it? Another British invention. And he folded invention. up some So you had sandpaper, and then obviously we use those uh, those matches to this day. Well, not those ones. Well, they're a bit <laughs> old. Um, anyway, next. 
1839. 1832. <laughs> Favourite story of the day. Favourite story of the day. A man called Thompson, he was a farmer. He was. He wanted to sell his wife. He yeah, was a he bit did. short of cash. So he put her for sale at the local market yeah. for 50 shillings. Yes. Didn't sell her. Did so he reduced the price to 20 and threw in the dog. <laughs> Did she get sold, though? I don't know, but I think it's a marvellous idea. <laughs> well done to you, John. Thompson, well done. Those are today's fascinating facts. Right, let's move on and talk medicine, uh, which we do on a Sunday, if you are just joining us. Um, lots and lots of stories. In fact, I've got so many stories, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, this is a, this uh, is in the Telegraph this morning. A game-changer UTI vaccine stops infection for nine years. You and I know all too well urinary tract infections are the bane of our lives. Lots of people get those. Uh, the, the Essentially, it causes... And these numbers are off the scale, aren't they? 150,000 hospitalisations each year. <coughs> just having an infection, a water works infection, a urinary tract infection, costs £380 million pounds to the NHS. Right, period. and it also kills people. It now, does this kill is mainly people. older people. Yes, um, so I can tell you the death rate is four in a hundred, but when you become over 95 it, it's then 10 percent so it's one in one i know in. but even before that that four in a hundred is probably older women yeah. and actually i'm gonna say this lots of these utis can be prevented with a very simple intervention which is vaginal estrogen yes um you know so if people don't want to have a vaccine or yeah, the yeah, vaccine yeah. is expensive there are other solutions and believe me lots of doctors do not think about it Really? Yeah. No. Uh, now, what I always found interesting was when someone presents with with um, a UTI, you, you you know you would expect them to have a, a frequency and urgency. No, they're confused. Exactly where mm -hmm. I was going with that. They come in and they just don't make any sense, particularly older people. Yeah. We always had a rule in A and E that if there was an old lady talking about insects climbing up the wall, she had She's a urine infection. I agree totally, <laughs> totally, and I saw it so often actually. Um, so this is quite interesting. It's a pineapple flavoured vaccine. And and they showed that by doing this for three months, actually, they managed to have a significant impact and uh, they followed them up for nine years. It's and also interesting the way it works. So they actually are using four of the most common bacteria that yep. cause UTIs. E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus vulgaris and Enterococcus faecalis. And by delivering those and making you develop an immunity mm. to them but not get a UTI, you actually hold on to that immunity for quite some time. Yeah, it's really good. I really like mm. that. Um, this is quite interesting as well. Some people see more per second than others, according to scientists. So, you know, like some people aren't very good at catching or fumbling a ball or whatever. They now have been doing experiments at Trinity College Dublin, looking at the speed of visual perception. And they say that actually it varies enormously mm. between individuals. So some people can see more information every second than others. So some people therefore would have an innate advantage in certain settings where response time is crucial, like ball sports. So we don't really know about how this variation in what they're calling visual temporal vision does. But that means that people have got a genetic advantage. Yes, and isn't this why only I think it's 1% or 0.1% of the country are able to be fighter pilots? Because it's about speed about it. of perception. Wow, that's really good. I really like that. Um, so the rate at which humans perceive the world is known as our temporal resolution. It's similar to the refresh rate on a computer monitor. And so, as we were saying, that some people perceive visual <laughs> signals much faster than others. I thought that was absolutely yeah, your shirt brilliant. is killing my visual perception. Listen, my sister bought it, so she'll <laughs> I be love around. It. Uh, good morning, Katie. I hope you're very well. I think they're back from holiday. Actually, oh. they had a lovely time. <laughs> I saw pictures of I saw pictures of, of the children all over the pyramids uh, in Egypt. So that was very nice. Uh, yes, so uh, this morning we are about to open our surgery doors. If you have a, a condition or a problem or you need some secondary advice, then do please get in touch. You know how to do that. Now, I want to talk about asthma because UK scientists say they found a new cause behind much of the damage that asthma causes. Oh, very I'm not sure this is new. No, I, well, I read it and I thought it was quite interesting. So, you know, when you get the tightness, uh, chest tightness and so on, and obviously the, the, the classic wheeze and so on, uh, the, the airways become inflamed and swollen, and we tend to treat 
using beta 2 agonists so you try and open up those airways and what this is saying essentially is that the, 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 the it, essentially we're targeting the wrong the wrong thing I actually didn't think this was much of a story I'll tell you for why mm. so I've suffered very badly from asthma so I know a fair bit about it and asthma treatment has changed dramatically over the years it has. we do now as doctors try to actually prevent attacks by using corticosteroids to keep that inflammation at bay the whole time and the biggest there are side effects there aren't that many side effects from an inhaled cause. Oh, inhaled, right. Inhaled, yeah. yes, inhaled. So, as a GP, we constantly have to say to people, why did you stop using your steroid spray? And people say, oh, because I wasn't getting asthma anymore. And we have to tell them that yeah. that's because they were using the steroid spray and to carry on. Now, the other big change that we've had in treatment over the last probably 15, 20 years is that we've now got long-acting beta agonists. Yes. So that actually has seen a game changer. So whereas I used to have to constantly use the little blue one, yes, which is the, the short acting, <laughs> yes, yes. yeah, the short acting, but people know that they're inhalers by colour. Um, the blue I don't, one. <laughs> I never ever have to use Not that. Not the now. brown one, the ever. blue one. The brown one is the steroid. Yeah. Yep. Um, I never have to use that anymore because I have a long-acting beta blocker. So you can keep that inflammation at bay. I'm not sure this story is as big as... Um, OK. Well, I'll throw it away. Um, prostate cancer I want to talk about as yeah. well. As you know, I this have a family. It is really interesting. Prostate, well, there are lots of things here. Just the numbers... Oh, I think I've just thrown that away, which isn't very <laughs> helpful. Oh, yes, I did. Um, prostate cancer, this is about the number of cases. The number of men diagnosed with prostate cancer worldwide is projected to double to 2.9 million. And this is because of age I by 2040 yeah and of course it's the commonest cancer in in men the figures and I I've done some work with uh, with, with the charity here 52,000 diagnoses every single year that means 144 men in this country are diagnosed with prostate cancer every single day and of those one person dies every 45 minutes it's a huge huge problem but but these findings are quite interesting they're in the La Lancet which is a medical journal they are uh, they were presented at the European Association of Urology and in Congress which was yesterday you're right it's about the increasing aging population people living longer but also I suppose what ties in into this is making sure that we have early diagnosis and you and I have spoken a lot about the PSA test which is a blood test and it looks and for it's not and really it's rubbish screening no test. and this is what I always try to explain to men when I see them as patients that actually there are lots of things other than prostate cancer that make your PSA go up Indeed. just having sex riding a bike ex vigorous ex exercise so and do you infection. just want to explain where the prostate is so the prostate is wrapped around the tube that carries semen and urine through the penis so lots of things when you're sitting on a bike you're putting any pressure on it a doctor examining your bottom mm. with a finger will push up mm. it will cause the prostate to release this hormone the problem then is if you get a raised PSA what do you do with it do you do an invasive test where you go in to look at the mm. prostate which can lead men impotent but the other issue with this is it can also identify prostate cancers that would never have needed treatment Yes, because you're more likely to die with it than of it. Yeah. And so this is a, it's, it's really not a very good screening tool. So patients have to be informed about what they're letting themselves in mm. for. What is a good screening tool is an MRI. Yes, and that brings me nicely into the TRANSFORM trial, a £42 million trial launched by Prostate Cancer UK, the charity that I do work for. Um, they're studying hundreds of thousands of men to see if MRI scans can do a better job at picking it up. They also found, this is a separate study actually, found that cutting the length of the MRI scanner by a third would make it cheaper and actually the results are no different. Cheaper and quicker so you Cheap, can fit more people you in. You can fit more people in and of course I, I, I'm at high risk of prostate mm. cancer. My dad died of prostate cancer. It runs in families. I'm very aware of that and so I get my PSA check but I'm like what do I do with that because it's a completely meaningless result. It's not completely meaningless. OK, but so we look at the, ch the change yeah, in that number. It's not, but, you know, the, we need to view it in context. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, um, lots more to get through as mm -hmm. well, but let's take some calls. Uh, Jackie in Manchester, good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. What can we How do you? for you? Right, I'm a 76-year-old lady. I suffer with ulcerative colitis, which I have done for about 15 mm. years, and I'm on acetone. Um, four weeks, five weeks ago, I had an infection. Uh, and I was given antibiotics. Uh, since I've had the antibiotics, I've had diarrhoea, and I've had this now for three weeks. It's very, very bad. Uh, my GP won't give me anything to block me up because he says of my ulcerative colitis. 
So I'm really, really, really down now with this now. I'm I can't sure. get out of the house. Can, can we just go back? Do you just want to explain ulcerative colitis? So I, ulcerative colitis is a, a disease where people can actually get ulcers along their... Um, their esophageal so, tract all the way down to their bottom. Yeah, it so can it's be an anywhere. inflammatory, it's an inflammatory. Bowel condition. Um, and it's the only one that actually goes from mouth to anus. So it can, they can be anywhere and they can cause diarrhea and pain and infection. It's a horrible disease. So I'm sorry that you've got that. Um, I'm going to ask you the first question. Do you take dairy in your diet? Um, well, since I've had I, I do, I love cheese, yes, I do. But I've, since I've had this, I've stopped taking it. What about um, milk in tea and coffee? No, I take, all I drink is hot lemon, sorry, hot water and lemon. I don't okay. drink any milk, I don't drink any tea or any coffee. Okay. I cannot get rid of this. I have done everything you've told me. I've been drinking water, I've been taking, eating regularly, small amounts, but I, can, I'm, a, I'm a no goer at the moment. Can I just ask you, what antibiotic was it, just to, out of interest? You know, I can't, I can't, honestly can't remember. It began with D, I think. Doxycycline? It, it might have been, but I didn't actually keep notice of it because okay. I didn't think anything of it. What was the infection? Can I ask that? Yeah. Yeah, it was in my throat. I couldn't speak for three weeks. I think it was in my esophagus. Right. right. Okay. Uh, that's an odd choice of drug if it yeah. was doxycycline. Um, I'm just wondering. So, what are we what are we thinking about bacterial flora? We a change in bacterial so flora. So, some probiotics. The, yeah, possibly. So, do you want to explain that as well? Yeah. So, obviously, when we take an antibiotic, one in five people will get diarrhoea. Actually, a little known fact, um, and that's one of the intolerable side effects for many. It's not an allergy. It's just that the antibiotic will wipe out all of your good bacteria wherever it is. It doesn't matter if we were aiming at your throat. So, it's somehow trying to replace that and get it back to balance for you you're probably a bit trickier because of your ulcer ulcerative colitis. So I yeah. would look at a really yeah. good probiotic. Um, there's, one called, there's one called Simprove, actually, that you can get on the NHS. Whether your GP will let, let you have it, your gastroenterologist probably would, mm. can be prescribed. It has to be kept in a fridge. But there are lots of others available. I think, from what I've read, that the ones that are of any use need to be refrigerated. So bear that in mind if you're going to buy one over the counter. Lots of natural yoghurt, Greek yoghurt, just trying to get that balance back. Um, you c Could you really not use a little bit of Imodium? I don't no, have you got a gastroenterologist? No, I, I tried it and he said, no, no. I spoke to him on Friday and said, no, I can't, Jackie. He said, because I said, what am I supposed to do here? Mm, because of us, so you can't do anything. What am I supposed to do? Is, is it worth trying to get a referral, I think, or maybe... And or some advice and guidance, because you can get an answer for that in a couple of days. Yeah. Your GP well, can do some advice and guidance. He can do it for you. You actually do it on the system to gastroenterology, asking for advice and guidance, it just quickly explain your problem and they'll come back with an answer. Right, whether we'll do that or not, I don't know. I think he's, he's just blind to the fact that... Well, well I, I, I think you just have to be very firm and to say, look, this is not acceptable, yeah. it's gone on far too long, I can't yeah. do anything. And also, I mean, also just with that referral back to the gastroenterologist, they may then decide that you need some sort of imaging or they may need to do some further investigations. Because the question is, how much of this is the UC and how much of this is, is, exactly. is the antibiotic use? And, and we can't answer that. It is called no, Simprove, I by the way, the probiotic, S-Y-A improve it is available on the nhs but whether or not he'll do it i don't know but you can google it simprove what's that sorry simprove for the probiotic Simproof, right. yeah. yes oh good luck Sorry, no, good luck. I, ho I hope that helps, but I think, um, you know, getting getting that advice from the consultant-led unit is a good idea. Uh, Terry is in Kent. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Terry. How can we help? Um, lovely to talk to you both. Um, I, um, I've got this congestion I've had for about 18 months now, and it seems to act at the night time, um, and uh, if I fall asleep during the day, I'll get this rattling in my throat. Um, I've had antibiotics and I, I can't clear it. It's not all the time, but I keep coughing and okay. when I wake up it makes me bring stuff up. You know? So this is, this is a really common problem that we see. Um, we see it um, quite often in London where there's lots of pollution, but also with people that have an allergic tendency. Do you have any allergies? Uh, I, I take hay fever pills, but I right. never used to get it. But what I, my history was uh, back in 2010 that I had um, two-thirds of my lung removed uh -huh. from lung cancer. Oh. And um, I'm on blood thinners because I had two stents put in about 18 months ago or so. Okay. Well, um, 
but think... I've, I've never smoked or anything like that, no. and I don't work in London anymore, so I just wondered, I've had antibiotics and nothing's happened. Okay, so I would do a few things. Antibiotics very rarely help this, I'm going to say that. Um, okay. It could be a chronic, what we call a chronic rhinosinusitis, or it could just be chronic catarrh, but I think uh, you need to dampen down your um, immune response, and the fact that it's happening at night says it probably is allergy-mediated, so right. I would look at some allergy bedding, if possible, just um, covering your mattress, your pillows, and your do with anti-allergy stuff but I would also take that antihistamine every day but combine it I with a steroid that. nasal spray so you I, can well, get, get that sorry. from the chemist I, I, they've given me one um, but because I'm on blood thinners because of my stent it's making your nose bleed yeah and I, oh. I broke my nose when I was young um, so I, I tend to blub at once so I cauterized but the other side starts to bleed now so I've, I've I'm still on the fillers, but I've stopped using the nasal yeah, spray. It's difficult, isn't it? It's a uh, 22 situation, yeah. isn't it? You know? yeah. So nasal rinses, like a neti pot or a Nilmed sinus rinse, any of those are very good to just okay. take some of that mucus out. Do it before you go to bed. Um, okay. Because other than the steroid nasal spray and those solutions, it's difficult then to consider where to go with you because you have other complicating factors. Right, OK. Yeah. Okay. I, I, just, I would get yourself, if you go to a chemist, there's a very good nasal wash called a Neil Med, Neil as in okay. the name, the man's name Med, um, and you literally lean over a sink and wash that up to get rid of some of the mucus. Okay. Um, I've, I've been told to um, use, um, you know, where you put um, Olibus oil in you know, and breathe it in. Yeah, yeah it might it's help. not going to hurt. Yeah. yeah. T t Terry, I hope that that does help as well. Thank you very much indeed for your call. We need to go to a break, but I just want to say from Judith, thank you. Good morning, doctors. Thank you so much for talking about prostate cancer. My husband was diagnosed in October. His PSA was 4.25, slightly raised, not massively. The MRI and biopsies found the tumour. The PSMA PET scan uh, then was done to rule out the spread. Uh, I wish more men would screen for this horrific disease. Of course, we talked about why screening is so complicated. My husband is now four months post-op. He has PSA tests every 12 weeks. There should be a national screening programme, and that is what we're trying to go towards. Um, my husband was asymptomatic. Judith, uh, good story. Yeah. I'm glad your husband's on the men. I think it shows the problems, though, uh, of implementing a screening programme, because you have to make sure it's efficacious, easy to roll out, cheap and easy and all of those things are, 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 are and difficult. meaningful and meaningful yeah, abs yeah absolutely right thank you very much indeed for all of those we'll take a break after the break it's our sunday surgery we're going to be asking the question why are so many young people getting cancer joining us will be professor angus adal gleish who's professor of oncology at st george's university in london don't miss that this is talk tv <laughs> Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast Time, 9.27 now. Dr Rennie uh, in the house, as am I. Uh, <laughs> lots of messages coming in as well. Um, I'm not sure if this is exactly right. Ooh, D, I'm <laughs> just throwing things around. D uh, says, on ulcerative colitis, I had this many years ago. I went to the GP who specialised in doing tests outside the NHS. I had a test. It found that it was actually, I was reacting to the skins of tomatoes. And that was the cause of the abject pain and diarrhoea. And at that time, I was eating healthy salads to try and stay healthy. He told me to cut tomatoes out for six months uh, and I didn't want the pain back, so I did it for a year. Uh, once I'd done that, the pain disappeared. It's not ulcerative colitis, no, I'm sorry. I, I, was I was about to say, I was about to say, it's that's, not ulcerative. That's gastritis yes, and yeah. tomatoes are a known irritant to the stomach and we always tell people to stop tomatoes. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? You are what you eat. <laughs> um, I had... Uh, hello and good morning to you. I had post-nasal drip for months and was told there was nothing to be done about it. My friend suggested antihistamines and it worked. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, this message from Susie. Doctors, please, capital letters, help me. I have the most terrible hay fever. Any tips on what to take yes. for it, please? I would rather not speak on the phone. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm I've fine. actually written a piece about this this week. So people with hay fever often go f to solve the problem that they've got. So some people get itchy eyes, some people itchy throat, some people sneezing, and they choose the method thinking that they'll treat just that. You need to go for all three types of hay fever treatments together so you need to take an antihistamine every day you need to use a steroid nasal spray every day and you need to use anti-allergy eye drops and together yeah. they work synergistically to dampen it down there you go i hope that uh, that helps some you. people say that naturally you hmm? should eat some people say that naturally you should eat honey that's from local bees so that you get um, a tolerance to local pollen Oh, and other like people that. say that you can put Vaseline up your nose yes. to stop the yes. pollen from adhering. And I've seen that work. I've yeah. seen that work with people. So there are some natural Oh, but I haven't heard the local honey thing. Mm -hmm. That's very good. I like that enormously. Right, so let's move on. It's time for Sunday Surgery. Dr David Bull's Sunday Surgery. So this is a big question. This was in the Times earlier in the week with the headline, Why are more young people getting cancer? Now, as we know, cancer is not rare. Half of us will get it in our lifetime. But obviously, this is all about uh, the Princess of Wales, uh, Kate Middleton. I think people were very shocked about the diagnosis, and, and, uh, and we've talked about it a great deal. Now, of the 375,000 new cancer cases in the UK every single year, just one in ten are currently in those aged under 50. But this pattern is changing, and there seems to be a rising tide of early-onset cancer. Research suggests an extra 10,000 adults aged 18 to 49 are getting a cancer diagnosis every single year in the United Kingdom compared with the 1990s. And that is a trend that's not just happening here in the UK. It is happening around the world. Now, several studies have drawn attention to this, this global surge in cancers in the young. There was a team at the University of Edinburgh found that worldwide new ca cases of cancer in under 50s rose 79% between 
1990 and 2019 to three point two six million. The question is, what is going on? Well, joining us now is Professor Angus Dalgleish, who's Professor of Oncology at St George's University in London. Very good morning to you. Good morning. It's a fascinating question, isn't it? And, and just, you, you, I, I mentioned that study then done at the University of Edinburgh. There was another one looking in Northern Ireland as well. They also showed the rate of early onset cancers had increased by 20.5%. Can you shed some light on that? Why would we be starting to see this, not just in the UK, but also around the world? You're quite right. First of all, it is um, throughout the world and many other countries you have not mentioned have reported exactly the same thing. And uh, it has been going on for quite some time. I first became aware of it in the uh, uh, 2010, 11, 12, when I started to notice that there were a lot of patients presenting with colorectal cancer who were in their late 30s, early 40s, and this, this was extremely unusual. And uh, I noted that uh, other people were seeing this and uh, it, be it became a real trend. Now, of the other cancers, this is, I think it's much later that this has become evident for the, the non-abdominal cancers, as it were. But uh, you have to think, you know, wh what is going on? What has changed with this generation? Is it uh, a lifestyle or is it genetics? Well, we know genetics are very important. For, for bowel cancer, but it's a fairly stable thing. And it has, it's not a good enough explanation, I don't believe. And you really do have to look at uh, diet. I mean, the, we think the diet and everything you're exposed to in the diet, especially processed foods, uh, a lack of very uh, good uh, raw uh, vegetables, etc., in a lot of these people, could explain what we know about uh, the link between uh, uh, diet and certainly bowel cancer. And uh, uh, Dennis Burkett, uh, who just, uh, was uh, involved with associating the Epstein-Barr virus with Burkitt's lymphoma in Africa, went on in his latter work to show that um, the diet and roughage correlated beautifully with bowel cancer. So with that scientific base, you have to look and say, has there been a big change? Well, there has. And the, the first culprit has to really be uh, processed food uh, as opposed to uh, uh, non-processed, non good, fresh, non-processed food. And, and, of course, part of that uh, diet is the, the lack of fibre in the diet. Now, could you just explain to people as well, there's a lot of work going on about uh, the microbiome. This is, this is really looking at the bacteria that... the nat We actually talked about this earlier. Um, the fact is we have natural bacteria, don't we, in our guts. Now, if, if we're not eating the right diet, or indeed if you have antibiotics, you then kill off that natural bacteria, you replace them with other bacteria. And, and it seems increasingly likely the microbiome microbiome, your own makeup of bacteria in the, in the gut, is actually fundamental to keeping you fit and healthy. Without doubt, and uh, with association with cancer, my uh, colleagues and I who've been interested in immunotherapy, using these new immunotherapy uh, antibodies, etc., to treat cancer. First, it was very successful in melanoma, but it's slowly rolling out to the other tumours started to note that the good responders were associated with a certain uh, flora in the microbiome, whereas the bad responders had a different microbiome. So there was a great push to, can you convert the bad to the good? And this went as far as uh, doing experiments with uh, a, 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 a uh, bluntly, people transplants, right? trying to get people with good microbiota like, to the people with bad and then retreating them and seeing if that improves things. Well, it did. But fortunately, there's a much, much simpler explanation of how you can have a good microbiome, and it is the high fiber diet. And one of the conferences I was uh, I went to some years ago, I was most impressed that rather than having to go to have fecal uh, transplants, a mere change of the diet from an ordinary processed diet to a high roughage, high fiber diet ended up with a good microbiome. So once again, it says this is, this is not magic or complex or expensive. You just have to change your diet. 
and I find this intriguing because many people in this country simply don't eat enough fibre. And when I lived in the United States, I started buying a fibre supplement and I take it every single day and it has a huge impact. How do people improve the fibre in the diet? You mentioned eating naturally, making sure we should be cooking from scratch, not eating processed foods, particularly processed meat, red meats and so on. What, how do people improve their fibre intake? Well, the, the fiber is 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 uh, raw and natural uh, substances. So, you know, fr like fruit and uh, porridge and roughage, etc. As opposed to highly processed foods, which is very common. Uh, for instance, if you have sausages and bacon, there's an awful lot of processed uh, food in that. And I myself, probably like you, uh, uh, used to have that when I was young. <laughs> but often now, I, I can deliberately try and avoid those, certainly unless it's a special occasion or something. And I think you can, you, you can do that. With regards to exactly what's high fibre and what's not, there are just every weekend there are um, cookery supplements and diet advice in every major newspaper <laughs> and uh, magazine that people can follow to suit have a high fiber diet that's uh, to their liking and uh, one that maybe they really like to switch to what, what, what do you make of that, uh, Dr. Rene? Mm -hmm. um, so I actually take this powdered fiber so supplement. Do, do you? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Another thing we have in common. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, it's kind of changed my life. Yeah, I think I think it's very important. Morning, Angus. I think, you know, this whole thing about we need to get people back to eating proper food mm. because processed food is even masticated for us so that children are getting uh, orthodontic problems more than they used to because they're, they're not, not developing their, their jaw teeth. muscles. I'm wondering, Angus, do you, you, we've spoken about food and colon cancer, but we've seen a rise in all other cancers as well. Mm. Do you think that processed food leading to obesity is then driving those other cancers? Yes, uh, that's a very good point because the uh, the processed food does is associated with uh, obesity. Mm. And once you get into obesity, I mean, my uh, simplification of obesity, I spent most of my life looking at really what causes cancer and what drives it. And uh, I came to the conclusion that the, the main cause and driver of cancer is chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is caused either by chronic infections, viruses, like uh, the human papilloma virus with uh, uh, cervix and uh, some bowel drives this chronic inflammation. And then the other cancers that don't have infectious causes are again associated with chronic inflammation, smoking and lung cancer, etc. So I think that uh, to, to uh, do everything one can to reduce chronic inflammation is a, is a really, really important thing. So that means avoiding all sorts of chronic inflammation, with bacteria, smoking. And we know that the processed food causes chronic inflammation in the bowel which is associated with colitis. And then eventually, as you know, we were taught at medical school, mm. if you've got colitis, you're more likely to get to bowel cancer. So I think uh, doing everything one can to reduce the chronic inflammation is important. And the biggest uh, form of chronic inflammation exposure is actually obesity. I mean, that's yeah. a, that, that is the, the conclusion. So once you're overweight, you are a, a chronic inflammatory object and you're, you're pouring out inflammatory factors okay. and that alone will increase and we now know that people are obese have higher instances really mm -hmm. all cancers, particularly breast and bowel and renal some ones you wouldn't expect such as renal cancer etc so reducing uh, everything you can do to reduce obesity will reduce the incidence of cancer. So, so can I? So, given that we know that 68% of men in this country are obese or overweight, 59% of women, but also we're seeing children getting fatter and fatter because they're eating the wrong diets. 22.7% of children in this country are obese by the mm. time they leave primary school, and our levels are much higher than other comparable countries like France, yes. Germany, Poland, and Slovenia, for example. So, so mm. then the question is, if if the kids are obese by the time they leave primary school, it then would stand to reason that if that continues, their risk of cancer is then much higher. It, it, I'm afraid you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, it really is going to be a linear increase, an associative increase. The more, uh, more earlier their kids get uh, obese, and the less they do about it to tackle it and reduce it, they will continue to get a bit, uh, fatter and fatter. The more the... Uh, uh, 
inflammatory mass will mount up, the more cancer will be fed, and the more incidents they're going to get. I mean, I'm afraid that the all, all the facts would agree with that without inducing any other actors, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, Rena, you want to talk about the vaccine? I do. I think, Angus, if I didn't ask you this question, our viewers would actually be furious with me. There are lots of people who believe that they've seen this rise in um, cancers, especially in earlier people, since the vaccine rollout. Can you just speak to that for us? Yes, I will. I'm, I'm very happy to. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was point out that this rise has been going on for several years before the COVID came out. I don't know if it's much that different in COVID. Anything that we saw was lockdown because people weren't being seen, symptoms weren't being addressed, mm. weren't being diagnosed. But it's something that many of us have written to the MHRA and to the, uh, uh, the government NHS about is, is that there's been an alarming increase in the rate of rise since the COVID vaccine programme was rolled out. Mm. And we basically said, hey, this is, it doesn't mean causality, but it does mean you don't want to be giving a vaccine against a virus that no longer kills anybody when it's associated with even a slightest uh, amount of uh, side effects. And we, we now know that, the, uh, that there's a clear link between the uh, booster vaccines and, uh, the, and cancer relapse. And I pointed this out over a year and a half, and I discussed this uh, with uh, Richard Tyson this in February did, last yeah. year. And uh, since then, there's been so many uh, people contacted me saying we're seeing exactly the same. They're seeing, uh, they're uh, published in major journals. And, you know, you can't say there's an association unless you have a scientific logic. And in no time at all, we could find it. And I must say, it is the booster vaccine, the booster ones that uh, account for this. When you have a booster, and I said straight away, against a virus that no longer exists, why would you vaccinate against the virus as long as it's left the planet? The variants are so different, they're not, not mm. containing it. But uh, colleagues uh, around the world have shown that the T cells are suppressed. One thing you want to do with the vaccines boost T cells, it actually suppresses T cell responses against everything else. And it switches the antibodies from being a, a neutralizing subtype to a polarizing subtype. So the boost is in, introducing a tolerizing milieu that you would like in a transplant patient. And that's why I believe a lot of these cancers, they're, they're freed from the control of the T cell police, yep. as it were, sort of escape. And we've pleaded that this be taken notice of and something be done about. Angus, can I just pause you? It's such an important point, this. I just want to take, if, if that's OK with you, I'd like to take you over the break because it, it's too important uh, to stop. But I do have to go to a break. Uh, Angus will be back after this break. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh? it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Was supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to uh, the Weekend Surgery. Uh, we are currently talking to Professor Angus Dalglish, Professor of Oncology at St George's University in London. And Rene rightly brought up the COVID vaccine because it would be remiss of us not to talk about that. Um, what you were saying just before the break, Angus, is absolutely fascinating because I found myself, I know regular viewers will know this, I found myself in the middle of this because obviously we were being urged to have the booster vaccines. Now, you were also sort of blackmailed almost into having it because you couldn't travel unless you'd been fully vaccinated and, and so on. Now, um, I have a very close family member who uh, um, Rene knows uh, now, after the booster, got myeloma. And that would then accord with what you're saying about the booster vaccine. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I was doing a melanoma clinic where I had patients who I treated with immunotherapy for year, years before it became de rigueur, who were doing exceptionally well, uh, disease-free, having been stage four for five years, to, one of them was 20 years, and they relapsed. And I'm used to looking at this sort of thing. It's usually excess stress in one's life for several months. There was none of that. And the only thing, doing a, a borrow on it, was was there anything they'd all had just before the diagnosis? They'd all had an unnecessary booster. And going back to the myeloma, I then had friends, and you mentioned the right scenario, who only had, I told them I didn't think it was wise to have the booster, they only had it. And two of them only had it so they could travel for their wives. And that's what we did, exactly what we did. Exactly. Now, in both these cases, the people felt awful after having it, and they ended up being very, very unwell. And I insisted they got uh, scanned, and they had bone metastasis, one of them wow. from melanoma, one of them from myeloma. And then I then found, asking questions, not at work, but amongst my contacts and everybody, I found eight cases of people who'd had lymphoma or leukaemia after the booster. And remember what I said about the booster causes this unnecessary immune suppression, suppression of the T cell response. Well, why would you do that? Now, I'm, I must say, I'm furious with the MHRA, NHS, Witty, and all this, that, and the other, because this is screaming. And all I was told to do was shut up. I would upset the patients. But when all around the world, my colleagues seeing exactly the same thing, and they were also told the same thing, to shut up and be quiet. This is, uh, I mean, I was carpeted for breaking NHS guidelines. Wow. And I said, sorry, the NHS guidelines are completely wrong. I I'm a doctor. My first uh, allegiance is to first do no yes. harm. Exactly. And I see harm being done by the booster. And as a lifelong scientist, clinical scientist, who's been working in developing vaccines for HIV and cancer for years, I know the reason. We have an old adage uh, in, the, in, our, in our work, as it was, any vaccine that needs a booster doesn't work, uh, certainly for infectious diseases. And I think that this 
this proves the case very much here. Fascinating. Um, I do really think that this is wonderful that you've, you've raised this because so many media people uh, will not discuss it, they will not reply, just like the government. I think it needs to be absolutely out there because we raised the thing about it's not just the vaccine that we have to address, but when you look at the graph, in 1921, the middle of 1921, the, uh, not only all the clots and the strokes and everything took off, but the cancer incidents started to take off, particularly in the under 50s. And you cannot ignore that. And there's people who have done some wonderful work on this. Carl Hennigan, yes. who's I mean, he, I mean, he's a great uh, admirer of the work that he's done. Norman Fenton uh, from the, St Mary's East London, uh, Claire Craig and Ross mm -hmm. Jones. They have analysed this and they have all come to exactly the same conclusions and I totally support them. And the other thing that we found is that I honestly do believe, and there's an article in The Telegraph today, which is the first time I've seen it really in black and white, said Pfizer lied mm. about the vaccine. They um, and we, 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 we talked about that right at the beginning of the programme, yeah. And as far, from my point of view, they uh, basically Pfizer should be held for account. They should be the the, uh, the the whole board, CEO, everybody should be held to account for this, and everybody that was involved, because we all know that early bears data that means adverse events to vaccines and reactions. Uh, they tried to hide. They tried to hide it for seventy five years. It only became available because the High Court judge says, "No, I want to see it now." Mm. And when we saw it, and uh, these people I've talked to, we looked at it, it was clear if you had an adverse event uh, from the vaccine, which there were far, far more than it ever should have been, you had a 3% chance of dying. If you caught the, uh, the virus, you had less than a 1% chance of dying. On that data, it should never even have been given an emergency licence. It was an absolute disgrace, the, the, the uh, manipulation of data and the hiding. And if it mean, I was so horrified by this. I can't believe that people would act like this. It just goes beyond everything. I, I, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And, of course, the public did this because they were being told by medics, by eminent people, you have to get vaccinated. It's the only thing. And as you say, actually, it's coercion. You couldn't actually travel without having that vaccine. <laughs> So given everything you've said, and you are an eminent man in this field, where do we go from here? What do we need to happen? Does it need to be a public inquiry? Do people need to be held responsible for what they did, for, for manipulating data, for not giving the public the truth? Well, I certainly think, I don't know about public inquiries because it looks like a way to uh, push the problem into the long sure, grass, sure. come out with an event 10 years when it's all, all over. I think there needs to be accountability. Help. Well, it's clear that we got things that uh, are very wrong. It's clear that the vaccine is still causing problems. And I saw, I saw in a clinic this week two people uh, present with cancers. Neither of them should have had that again. They both had an unnecessary booster, one of them to travel and the other because they were told they were at risk and they developed these cancers. It is going on. You must banish all these cancers now, vaccines now, because they're doing so much damage. The second thing, we must banish messenger RNA technology uh, because yeah. I've told you about how it causes immune suppression, but it gets even worse, and I don't want to go into that. We know enough about messenger RNA technology. They should never be used for infectious disease vaccines. And you have Moderna and Pfizer and uh, all these companies pushing them. It should be banned. Our own government <clears throat> is giving money to Moderna to produce vaccines for the future. And I would never allow messenger RNA vaccines. Some of these people higher up shout at me, what do I know? I'm just an oncologist. Mm. Well, unlike them, I can tell you, I sat on the scientific board of a, of a vaccine company that only made messenger RNA vaccines, and I knew then they were insuperable problems in, in safety, and yet those have been thrusted so, aside. For so, 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 so on that, and I do have to move on, unfortunately, but just on that, basically with the mRNA technology, this is new technology, we hadn't tried it, we had parallel processing in terms of the way the safety data was done, we never do that, ever, and that we waived all of these safety protocols for, to expedite it. Absolutely, that's what happened. 
Angus, oh, really good Angus, to talk to you. you. Um, actually, I'd love to get you back on another time if we can and to explore this a bit more. Thank you so much for your time, though. That's Thank Professor you. Angus Dowglish, who's Professor of Oncology at St George's University in London. He's been shouting about this for a very long he time has. and he's been shut down. He has indeed. And that's why we do need to be able to at least talk about mm. it. We might not be right, David, but we need to be able to talk about it. But there certainly are signals. And throughout COVID, just as Angus was, any of us that raised a signal, I raised the myocarditis signal in children, we were shut well, down. We you were... know my personal story about I that. Do. You know, I was there when, yeah. when my mum got myocarditis. Mm. And, and, you know, she, she, I, I, didn't, I thought she was coming back from America in a box. So I think there are two messages to take from that. Don't have any more boosters, seems to be the message from Angus. But also, so don't be obese and eat healthy, not processed. Very good, Doctor. Thank you very much indeed. Let's take some calls. Uh, that was so interesting. Char is in Sussex. Good morning. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm hoping you can help me here. Sure, <laughs> nice you try. Um, hi. So I basically have only just recently been diagnosed with chronic fatigue. Um, I also suffer with chronic pain as well, but... Um, I've only just received my referral, which is still another month away, and I'm just I'm struggling. Um, the medication sure. they're putting me on, nothing's working. It's been about five years, unfortunately. Um, the proxen, gabapentin, all different kinds of uh, different doses, venifloxacin. Um, they've upped my gabapentin in the last few days, and I'm struggling to walk because of the leg swelling. And, yeah. The side effects like it is crazy. Yeah, can yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Can I ask how old you are? I'm 41. Gosh, okay. young. You're very young. Yeah. Um, did you have any sort of virus beforehand that triggered this? No, not at all. Um, maybe trauma may have been a result of it, I'm okay. possibly thinking, but I've never actually got to the bottom of it. Or Have you I had your like hormones tested? Like Yes, Ooh. I've had every single blood test done under the sun. But have you? Well, they wouldn't necessarily do those tests, would no, they? No, and especially as you're young. So I think hormones play a major part in fatigue. And so right. I'm not saying that they are the cause of chronic fatigue, but what I'm saying is if your hormones are not right, they can make it worse. So, so what they would have done when you say you've had all the bloods, they would have actually done things like a full blood count. They would have looked at your renal profile. They would have looked at maybe your yeah. liver profile, but they wouldn't have looked at hormones. So I would, okay. I would no. ask them to look at your female hormones, your FSH, LH, um, estradiol, progesterone, and just see what's happening with you. You're 41, you're coming into the perimenopause area, and um, things are going to start getting worse mm -hmm. because we start getting more tired then. So it may be that we can improve things by actually looking at hormones and adding to those. So I think that's a worthwhile. Then I think, just as we've been talking about, taking a good fibre, a multivitamin, and maybe even a gut probiotic so so fascinating and so much comes back to to bacteria to fiber to eating well avoiding processed foods and so on a chart i hope that helps you uh, this you morning well. good morning peter Cardwell. good morning i was just walking into the studio and said you're 41 you're coming into the menopause and i thought <laughs> i'm only 39 <laughs> we've aged you, you. Not, menopause hasn't into started the menopause. Yet. No, not, not yet not, not yet, yet. <laughs> andropause Andropause in men. What's that? What if he identifies as a woman with menopause? Well, he may well do. Well, it's that's a nonsense. No, no, that's a very long story. We had that conversation. Uh, uh, so, what, what's coming up in the show? Well, I've got an interview with uh, Ehud Barak, the former uh, Prime Minister of Israel, well um, because it is the six month anniversary of the Hamas terrorist Indeed. atrocities on the 7th of October. So, we're going to be talking to him. We're going to be talking to the uh, cousin of someone who is still a hostage in uh, uh, captured by Hamas. We're going to do a whole hour on where we are with Israel. Fascinating comments mm -hmm. from uh, Oliver Dowden this morning saying, the Deputy Prime Minister, saying that Israel's been held to a higher standard. There's almost a relish, he says, mm -hmm. that people are looking at, certainly with this horrendous uh, attack, which absolutely shouldn't have happened, mm -hmm. on those seven aid workers, uh, three of whom were British, who died. So we're doing a whole hour on that. Yep. So we've got a view on Israel, whatever it is. We're getting all sides of this. We're talking to aid workers, all sorts of people. Let me know. Um, we're also talking about... Um, all sorts of things in regard to whether the UK has failed to prepare for war and the fact that all seven British terrorist co-conspirators of an Al-Qaeda dirty bomb are freed after serving just half their sentences. Wow. Why on earth has that happened? So there's loads in this. Uh, we're also talking about um, uh, Vimto, 